term expires after this meeting as well as Mr. Stangy. Mr. Stangy has some remarks. Yes, uh, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank council for uh, my appointment. Uh, I've been able to serve on the board for three years. Uh, during that time, my wife and I have been blessed with uh, two young children, and uh, I, I made a decision, uh, I guess about two months ago, uh, just uh, in correspondence with council asking that I not be considered for reappointment, uh, just because of uh, time commitments with my family and, and my business. So I would like to, uh, again, just publicly thank council uh, for uh, appointing me to this position and, and showing confidence in me to uh, entrust me with this. Uh, I do appreciate it and uh, wish whoever uh, is to succeed me in this seat uh, the best of luck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other remarks? Mr. Wallace, could you please attest and verify the postings? I, Michael Wallace, the zoning officer for the city of Scranton, do solemnly swear that I have posted the premises listed with a notice of zoning hearing poster in reference to the following. Pinswood Manor Real Estate Association at 929 Cedar Avenue. Krishna Kukul and Francisco Martinez at 732 Prospect Avenue. The University of Scranton at 219 Jefferson Avenue. 1021 Mulberry LLC, 421 Clay Avenue. And Mark and Robert Lucci at 1741 Perry Avenue. Could you please call the first applicant? Francisco Martinez and Krishna Kuko at 87 Mill Street, Newburgh, New York, or 732 Prospect Avenue, Scranton. The applicant seeking to reopen a grocery store at 732 Prospect Avenue that has been closed over six months in an R2 zone. Please come up to the podium. Could you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Could you please state your name and address? My name is Francisco Martinez. I live in 87 Mill Street, Newburgh, New York, and I own the property of uh, 732 Prospect Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania. Do you need his last name spelled? Okay. Martinez. She's got it. All right, proceed. Okay, uh, I'm just here to um, um, to apply to get uh, my grocery uh, to reopen. It was closed for more than six uh, months, so now I got a new tenant that wants to open a grocery. But uh, uh, I need to get approval of, to reopen. Okay, to make things is the tenant here. Yes, because we're going to have to ask some questions. Please raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Yes. Could you please state your name and address? Krishna Quinkel, uh, 541 Birch Street, Scranton, Pennsylvania. Could you spell that last name, please? Kukel, K-U-I-K-E-L. Okay, could you tell us about your plans for the store? Uh, I'm opening grocery store. It used to be a grocery store in the same place, 732 Prospect Avenue. So I want to reopen the grocery store. So it would be like the food <coughs> items and the meat items. What are your hours of operation? I'm sorry? Your hours of operation, how long when so, will you be open? Nine to nine. Monday through Friday, Saturday through Saturday. Uh, all days a week. Do you have employees? Will you have employees? Uh, this is a family business. We are trying to open it. So we, like the family members, will be working in there. For the retail store out, and actually, it previously was a retail store. It had been to the zoning board. 
and it was approved now for retail stores. You're looking for. So it's one per 200 square feet? One per 200 square feet. He's showing 2,000. He's showing 2,000 square foot in his application. So he needs 10 spots then. Plus employees. Plus employees, yeah. You have three spots in the front. Is that right? Three spots? Uh, I'm sorry. What do you mean? Parking spots in the front. Yeah, yeah there are four parking spaces. Well, one of them is right smack in the middle of the front door, so wouldn't that be like loading space? Uh, I, saw, <clears throat> I saw spots for four, but runners right, whoever walked out the door, they'd, be, they'd have to, do you know what I mean? Right as soon as you walk out the door, that's the spot, but <clears throat> okay. shouldn't that be used for loading and unloading? Okay, right in front of right the door. Back and forth. Yeah, that shouldn't be a spot. All right, okay. So the where I can put the, uh, the place where the handicap parking is? Well, you need 10 spots. So Plus 10 for your customers. Yeah, so th there is one handicap parking right in front of the door. So you want that one to make as uh, loading and unloading? Okay. Well, I was saying you need 10. You have three. I, I think let, let's, let's back up a little bit. Yeah. Um, your application says that the lot <coughs> size is 2,000 square feet. Now, how much of that 2,000 square feet is building and how much of the building is actually used for the sales? I don't know if Mr. Martinez could answer that or if you could answer that. Yes, the business is only, um, it's like, it's uh, 50 by 35, it's not. So 50 by 35. Yeah, it's, uh, um, uh, we went through the, uh, to the same thing before, and, uh, and it was a approval for a grocery uh, when the, I did apply before. So the, well, the, the parking was one of the, uh, uh, but uh, I think I have enough, sp enough space for for parking, so and it's, it's not that big store. It's, it's just a uh, small grocery store. How so many apartments on top? It's two apartments uh, upstairs, yes. Where do they park? Uh, the, on the street. They, they, are not, they don't park on the, on the, only on nighttime they're allowed to park in, uh, but not during the day. How long ago was that a grocery store? Uh, just uh, like uh, seven months ago. Is seven months? Yeah, yeah. And, w and is there a bakery in there now? Uh, it was bakery and grocery. Uh, now uh, it's going to be just a grocery store. It's not going to be a bakery no more. So it was bakery and grocery. <laughs> you said family business, right? It's a family business, yes. How many does that entail? Huh? How many does that entail? Do you know? How many family members? How many family members will be working there? Up uh, four. So they have o other job too. Two of them have the other job too. When uh, like, so they are going to work in this spare time in the store. How many employees will be working at the same time in the store? Two. So. Maximum two sometime and just one. Dan, is your math done? How many parking spaces does he need? Well, it's at 1750. Well, he would uh, normally need eight plus two. He'd normally need 10. So we're still uh, at the number 10. <laughs> right, and, okay. and uh, obviously the, the previously ongoing business never had 10 either. But you also have two apartments that legally are supposed to have one and a half parking spaces each. So that's, in theory, 13 off-street spots that are needed. And we're dealing with four. Mr. Martinez, with the previous uh, variance that was granted, uh, did those apartments exist at that time? Yes, it was exit. And I have a picture of the, uh, of the building and the front of the store. The, uh, because that was the same concern uh, at that time. And uh, we, um, there's, n I mean, there was, it was been, it's been a store for, for years, and it's been a... Uh, well, if you have pictures for us, you can...
Mr. Martinez, how many different store owners have been in there in the last five years, six years? On the same place? Yeah. Two. Two? Yeah. Uh, I was one of them when I first opened it, and then I just rented. And then uh, no, it was empty. I didn't have a chance to run it again. So because I live in New York now, and he also lives on, on the same uh, apartment now because that's uh, on a corner of Prosper and, and Bridge. So we got, he lives in the same apartment, but we got parking on the, on the other side of the, of the building for, for him. And what's in the basement of the building? Uh, it's empty now. What was in the basement? Uh, it's been empty for... Uh, the last time it was occupied, what was in the basement? On the basement, it was... Uh, when I bought it, it, it was a um, uh, car... Uh, um, it was like mechanic. Yeah, it was garage. It was a garage. Garage. Yeah. garage. That's when I bought it. Okay. Uh, so. Now, do you have intentions of renting that out? Uh, no. No, I want to keep it uh, for myself as a storage. Uh, I don't think it, it would be possible to, because we got uh, apartments upstairs. Even for mechanic, it's not it's not right because they work with cars and 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 never thought about renting it. Uh, it's a big space, but it's it's not. I want to keep it as for me. Okay. So, uh, with respect to the basement, if we were to put a condition on your variance that it may only be used for storage or, you know, something to that effect, would you have any objection to that? No. Okay. Be Thank just you. storage uh, uh, for myself. All right. Uh, Mr. Pugel, please. Do you have any experience running a grocery store? Uh, yes, I, I'm actually uh, new to the United States. When I, I'm, I'm, I'm from Nepal. So when I was in Nepal, my dad used to run a grocery store. So from my childhood, uh, I, I saw how my dad was doing his business. And I also have the, uh, the business background because I did the college degree from uh, India in business. The what are you specializing in at your store? Is it just a very general type store? Are you specialized as far as providing Indian food? Yeah, it, it will be like more like the Indian and more like Asian food. But I will go on the customer demand if, if I see more, more customer from the different, the different background and if they want to have some want to try the different taste of food, and I will definitely try to get it for them. All right. Do you have any intention of selling or applying to sell, you know, alcohol or anything like that out of this location? No. No. If, if I do it in future, if I make a mind to stay in that place for a long time, more than five, six years, if I change my mind, I'll definitely get uh, all the inspection done and get the license to do the alcohol, but for now, this is just the grocery store. Any other is there anybody here to offer any testimony? Pleasure of the board. I would like to I guess I'm, uh, put the condition on the variance that the basement be used only for storage purposes and uh, no alcohol uh, be sold from the location. I'll second that. You have to make a motion. You make a motion. I'll make motion, a motion made and seconded. Mr. Wallace, could you take a vote on the additions? Mrs. Newcomb? Yes. Mrs. Wardell? Yes. Mr. Bardini? Yes. Mr. Standing. Yes. Mr. Yes. Now do I have a motion on the application? I'll make that motion again. Second. 
Mr. Wallace, a motion made and seconded. Could you please take a vote on the application? Mrs. Newcomb? Yes, I'll say yes. Mr. Wardell? Yes. Mr. Bartnicki? Yes. Mr. Stanley? Yes. Mr. Copes? Yes, by a vote of five to zero, your application's approved. Good luck to you. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you very much. Mr. Wallace, could you please call the second applicant? The University of Scranton, 445 Madison Avenue. Applicant seeks a dimensional variance for site triangle encroachment associated with new building construction at 219 Jefferson Avenue, a CD zone. Excuse me, sir. Could you speak at the podium, please? As I said, I'm Attorney Patrick Lavelle. It's my privilege this evening to be representing the interests of the University of Scranton. They, as you know, have presented an application seeking a variance from three of the site distance requirements for a new building which they propose to construct at the intersection of uh, Jefferson Avenue and Linden Street. Um, we have a series of uh, renderings of the proposed building as well as several renderings showing the existing site and what it will look like once the, uh, once the new building is erected. Um, uh, I, what I'd like to do is to bring to your attention initially uh, the building that you see presented on my uh, the left hand side here is the proposed building which will be erected uh, and it's at the intersection as I said before of Jefferson and Linden. Uh, it will be an eight story facility and it will replace what is uh, now known as Leahy Hall. Leahy Hall will be demolished and uh, this new building will be constructed in its place. Um, what we will bring to your attention are there's a series of photographs that are going to show you the existing structure as well as the uh, sightline setback uh, requirements that, uh, from which we seek the variances. Um, uh, the, the three variances that the university is seeking is identified on the second page of the application that you have in front of you. Um, and basically what they do is 
They seek a uh, sightline variance, first of all, for the uh, intersection of Cressler Court and Linden Street. And the, the issue at Cressler Court and Linden Street is uh, traffic coming uh, up Linden Street, uh, which uh, Cressler Court, I bring to your attention, is a one-way court. You can only come out into Linden Street. You cannot make a right-hand turn into Cressler Court. The second variance that we seek is the sightline variance for um, coming up Linden Street and turning either left or right onto Jefferson Avenue. As you know, Jefferson Avenue turning right is a three-lane road. Turning left, it's a one-lane road. Turning right in the three-lane road, you're heading south. Turning left onto Jefferson, you're heading into a, a northerly direction. The third variance that we seek would be coming from Jefferson Avenue, either from the north or the south, and turning into Linden Street, which currently is an impossibility because Linden Street is one way in the opposite direction. So I think at this point, uh, what I should do is uh, introduce the first individual who will testify on behalf of the university, and that is David Hemler. Mr. Hemler. Mr. Hemler. If we have any questions that you need to assist them with, we would need you to be standing over there at that point in time. Mr. Hemler, you're not an attorney, correct? No. Okay, then I need to swear you in. Could you please raise your right hand? You solemnly swear the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Could you please state your name and address? My name is uh, David Hemler. I'm an ar architect with the firm of Hemler Combined Architects. Our office is in the city of Scranton on Lackawanna Avenue, where we practice architecture for a little over 35 years. Okay. You need to spell a last name or you have that -E one? H-E-M-M-L-E-R. Okay. Proceed, please. Mr. Hemmer, you're aware of the fact that we're here to discuss a uh, request for a variance or actually a request for three variances from the sightline provisions required in the zoning code in order to construct in addition to the Elizabeth College for Professional Studies building provide desperately needed and expanded facilities for the physical therapy, occupational therapy, and exercise science department departments, which have a strong existing relationship to the programs of nursing and counseling and the Leahy Free Clinic, which is located in McGurn Hall. The PT and uh, OT and exercise facilities are currently located in Leahy Hall, the former YWCA, and next to McGurn, but are undersized and not adequate. New facilities are needed. Additionally, after uh, comprehensive studies by several architects over about the past three to four years, it has been determined that the YMCA building uh, construction does not meet code. Uh, the building is partially wood construction, some of the floors. Uh, this, this addition that we're doing will replace Leahy Hall 
and the building behind it. Uh, and since the only way to put the program, the amount of space that we need for this addition on the site is to essentially build up um, on, onto uh, the building and an existing wood structure simply isn't going to hold uh, another four floors. relationships of, of the functions to each other in this building as it also in McGurn, it makes it all but impossible to fit. The program and site have already forced a high-rise type of construction of a building. We are already at the limit of that height restriction uh, and uh, really can't go, can't go any further. Uh, and given the size of the site and the program and, and uh, what's necessary to fit. There is a hardship of fitting this onto the site and so for that reason we're seeking some relaxation from the site line variance. Um, with respect to the uh, utilization of the, the first floor, are there any particular uh, points that you'd like to bring to our attention relative to utilization of the first floor? Well, the first floor, as I said, is primarily pedi pediatrics, and it's some, somewhat in, in complement to the uh, Leahy Free Clinic, which is located in the basement of the adjacent building. But at any rate, they're largely pediatric children clients, uh, clients of the Northeast Intermediate Unit. Uh, one, there's one group of children who are uh, severely and physically handicapped. That's why we wanted the drop off and we have an elevator for them, them to come in from the back. Uh, many have tracheotomies and are accompanied by nurses. Uh, visit, visits to the university to the pediatric play area, in essence a field trip for these kids that uh, often only, their only community interaction uh, that they might get. Uh, we've learned this information as in planning the building and what we term programming the building 
we interview the various faculty members and un try to gain an understanding of who will be in the building, what their functions will be, what they'll be doing to sort of customize the space for that. There's an existing uh, group of children with autism that can't really do regular school um, and can't really be in an environment that is tip the typical children enjoy, such as a Chuck E. Cheese or something like that. There are children with Down syndrome um, and come um, by way of a support group for parents of, of children with Down syndrome. Kids with Down syndrome are mixed with typical kids in play groups and it provides an opportunity for typical play experience for these kids. There's also uh, a pro bono assessment function, I think which is important um, to provide services for children of uninsured individuals in the community and come to the University of Scranton by word of mouth and the services are provided free of charge by the faculty. So I think there's a community function to the building as there has been with uh, the Leahy Clinic and I think will continue to be with what's planned for the main floor of this building. Thank you. I have a few questions. Uh, the footprint of this new building, is there any deviation from the old footprint? Conforming building at this point because yes, right. it doesn't meet the site requirements as it is. Right. And I'm looking at 806 C1 of our uh, ordinance, which talks about that a non conforming structure, as we have here, can be reconstructed or expanded, providing that such action will not increase the severity or the amount of the non conformity or create any new nonconformity. I think you're, it sounds as though your testimony is toward that, that you're not creating any new nonconformity and you're reducing the severity of the present nonconformity. Yes. Is that your testimony? That's correct. Okay. We're trying to best we can in most areas to comply with some of these setbacks. Part of the problem is that we're trying to make sure Uh, before you finish down that one, the intent obviously with, with the new building, is it going to increase the student population using that intersection? Um, well, a, a lot of the, uh, the students are housed in facilities in, in the uh, existing facility in, in a rather tight manner. Uh, will it, it may increase the slightly, but I don't think too significantly. Only because that is one tough corner specific times and the change of class is very difficult for traffic to flow through there. Uh, I'm just wondering if the university is taking any additional steps to ensure that traffic will flow uninhibited. I, the, the lights are timed, but you do have a number of students that like to extend that time, even though people have been given a green light. And, it does jam up traffic as much as they would like to get to class at 8.30. People would also like to get to work at 8.30. So I'm just curious as to what the university is intending to do about that. The university can certainly address it. That's a concern. We can certainly address that. They do have their own police force, correct? Yes. I, the fact that they could possibly put down at 
specific morning times when you've got a situation or in the afternoon you have a situation of traffic flowing to and from work just to station someone there to expedite the flow of traffic and the stopping of students from crossing against the light just a recommendation with respect to the old structure and the new structure that you're going to be putting in uh, in raising the old structure are you maintaining anything from the old structure uh, yes Attorney Penitar, my I, I saw the same uh, point that you just made, but the, I guess my uncertainty is is whether or not raising a building in its entirety and then rebuilding it in its entirety and just transplanting, you know, yeah, some the, of the fixtures would be considered reconstruction or that, new that reconstruction. That is that is your interp that is an interpretation for the board to make whether that's a reconstruction or not. It's a beautiful little building. And that's all you're going to save is a, an archway and some stained glass. It seems, seems such a waste. Isn't there any way that you can build up from that McGurn Hall? Why couldn't you? Why couldn't that be done? Was that considered? Or, and if it was. by the board of the gentleman uh, mr. Wallace uh, just to be clear uh, in your evaluation of this the only three um, issues that you saw were the three that the university is uh, pointing out that's correct right. thank you
professional engineer, Mr. Osborne. I'll need to swear you in. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Could you please state your name and address. Uh, my name is David Osborne. I'm a professional engineer, um, 19 Fern Avenue, Carbondale, Pennsylvania. O-S-B-O-R-N-E. Mr. Osborne, where are you employed? Uh, I'm employed for SECO Associates, Civil Engineering Office in Scranton. How long have you been a licensed professional engineer in the Pennsylvania? Since 1983. Um, you have shared with members of the board and placed on the, uh, one of these easels a, uh, a set of drawings. Is that correct? That's correct. And did you oversee the preparation of these drawings? Yes, I did. Okay. Can you tell us what are they? Uh, there's a series of drawings. The first one. Uh, depicts the three sight line <clears throat> the three sight lines for tonight's meeting the one sight line is for Kressler Court second sight line is for Linden Street to Jefferson and the third sight line is for Jefferson to Linden Street and they're depicted on the first drawing Mr. Adam, I heard your attention that section 803 C1 of the zoning ordinance of the city of Scranton provides Site, distance, and intersections are required to, and I'm quoting, to ensure the traffic passing through an intersection or turning onto a street can safely see oncoming traffic. Are you familiar with that provision? Yes. Okay. Now, did you have the opportunity in the preparation of these drawings and by virtue of visiting the site to make determinations as a professional engineer with regard to whether or not uh, the requested uh, variances here this evening would still allow traffic passing through these intersections to do so safely. Yes, I believe they do. they will. Okay. Now, you've shown us the first drawing, which in essence is a compilation of the three uh, variances that are sought. Why don't we go to the second drawing and tell us what's the picture in that? This, the second drawing depicts the sight lines um, for Kressler Court coming onto Linden Street. The sight line coming onto Linden Street looking west as you come out onto Linden Street, and, and Kressler Court is one way uh, entering onto Linden. Uh, Linden Street is one way traveling west to east. Uh, the sight line triangle that's shown for Kressler Court looking west on Linden Street is obstructed by a building that's not part of the project. It's, it's obstructed by the Adlin building, which the uh, university has, we, is not part of the project and we have no control. In my opinion, the sight line triangle to the, to the right, looking up Linden Street, um, is, is really irrelevant because Linden Street is, is one way traffic and there, should be, there will be no traffic uh, traversing Linden Street traveling east to west. This, the second sightline triangle is uh, traffic traveling east on Linden Street entering onto Jefferson Avenue. Uh, the sightline triangle, uh, which is not part of the project, but if you're looking uh, north onto Jefferson, there is, there is no obstructions there. And the sightline, uh, if you were to turn right or travel south onto Jefferson, is impacted by the corner of the existing Leahy Hall, Leahy Hall building. Uh, I, I would point out, though, that um, 
part of the reason that we we feel comfortable with the sightline triangle is that this this is a signalized intersection and, and traffic is controlled by the traffic signal at uh, the corner of Jefferson and Lake uh, Jefferson and Linden I also want to bring out that the traffic turning from Linden onto Jefferson is turning onto three lanes of traffic onto Jefferson there's three lanes there's two through lanes and a, and a right turn lane there turning left Turning left, you would be turning into one lane, but there is no, 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 obstruction. no obstruction there. No obstruction turning left. Right. Okay. Um, we heard Mr. Helmer mention earlier this evening that the subject property is in a CD or commercial district zone, as is the majority of downtown streets. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So, is there a setback requirement for the existing building? Which is, the, which is the old uh, YWCA building, which is now Lady Hall. There, there is no requirement for front, side, or rear yard setbacks. Uh, the setback is zero. Uh, and in fact, Lady Hall is not on the property line. It is actually set back a couple feet from the property line. The proposed building, the proposed building is set back further? The proposed building is basically on, this, on the same building line. Um, the third one that you have, showing the sightline setback, what is depicted in this one? This is the sightline triangle for traffic traveling uh, north on Jefferson Avenue. Shows the sightline, which is impeded by the uh, existing Lady Hall building, uh, looking west onto Linden Street. Um, sight triangle looking, uh, turning left. Again, this is a signalized intersection. Uh, at Jefferson. Uh, one, of the, one of the items, the uh, sight line that we've shown is as per the ordinance, which is to the center line of the street. Uh, but I, as I mentioned earlier, Jefferson Avenue in that direction is three lanes. So, so technically, the, the car the sight line distance or the sight line triangle for the cars traveling on Jefferson in that lane, at apex of that sight line should actually shift, in my opinion, but it's not per the ordinance. 12 12 more feet, which would allow you much more sight distance looking down Linden. Now, Linden Street in that area, Linden Street is one way, is that correct? That's correct. And so, someone coming either uh, north or south on Jefferson, will they be able to turn down Linden Street? No, they cannot. Okay. Um, prior to coming here this evening, have you examined the uh, Yes, we have. We actually requested through the Scranton Police Department, um, we made a request for any accident data or any accident reports for the last five years. Um, we were provided four accidents in the last five years, of which none of the accidents were at the intersection itself or really were a result of any sightline issues. There is no additional safety issue other than existing conditions there today. So the proposed situation, tearing down the building, the building no one, would not worsen that situation. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, with respect to the uh, sightline triangle for the traffic turning into Jefferson Avenue from Linden Street, is there a safety issue there in your opinion? There's, there's no additional safety issue than what exists today. In fact, uh, as Mr. Himmler explained earlier, the location at the corner of Jefferson and Linden will be slightly improved from the existing site triangle that's there today. Finally, with respect to the uh, traffic, uh, the theoretically, the turn from either direction, uh, traveling either direction from Jefferson Avenue on Linden Street, is that a legitimate concern in light of the fact that Linden Street is one way in the opposite direction? I, I, don't, I don't believe so.
I have no questions. Anybody on the board have any questions for Mr. Osborne? Thank you. Thank you. Shift that over a little bit because I can't see who's at the podium. <laughs> That's better. Um, we're putting up uh, just another view of the proposed building. So you get the view from Jefferson Avenue. The other one was more or less from the corner of uh, Linden and uh, uh, Jefferson. This one, I think, is more of a frontal view on Jefferson. Um, I'd just like to mention to you that, uh, that the pr building which is proposed to be constructed is certainly a permitted structure and it's a permitted use in the CD zone. Uh, although the existing, the existing building does not comply with uh, site distance requirements as discussed here this evening, uh, we say that the site distance variances which are sought are no worse than the existing conditions. We don't worsen them at all. Uh, I think that to comply to require strict compliance with the site distance requirements where Linden Street intersects with Cressler Court and Jefferson Avenue would create a hardship because it would diminish the needed square footage of the proposed building. I say it would reduce the size of the first floor, which is intended to be utilized as space for pediatric clinics and other disabled children, as Mr. Hemmler capably discussed with you. I say that the reduction of the space on the first floor may actually necessitate uh, building a ninth story so as to comply or satisfy existing university or needed university requirements and that would otherwise not be necessary but uh, certainly if we build a ninth, ninth floor that would require securing another variance. Um, as Mr. Osborne pointed out, uh, the fact that Cressler Court is a one-way drive that enters Linden Street should negate any requirement to comply with the site distance because it's traveling on to Linden, traffic would be traveling on to Linden Street. It's one way, and um, uh, it does not seem to violate the uh, site distance requirement. The fact that the intersection of Linden Street and Jefferson has a traffic signal where no accidents have occurred during at least the last five years should also negate any requirement to comply with the site distance at this intersection. The fact that Linden Street is one way going east when it intersects with Jefferson Avenue also uh, going west and vehicular traffic is specifically prohibited from uh, entering it that should also negate any requirement to comply with the site distance requirements at this intersection. I think that the granting of the requested three variances will not alter the character of this commercial district, certainly will not be detrimental to the public welfare and represents the minimum variance that will afford requested relief. Thank you. Only one more question before you go. The on-street parking that's currently there on Linden Street, is there going to be any change to that? To the best of my knowledge, no. Okay, the university is not looking to do anything no. with that or obtain no. them? Okay. No. All right. Who, who is the best person to ask about traffic for I'm this sorry? project? Um, I recall a couple of years ago you were, I don't know, you built that building up on Mulberry Street? Yes. The traffic had to shift all the way over to the right. They had to close an entire lane. Is that going to happen here? No. no so That's no not what's contemplated. No. Linden Street is not going to be taken away, uh, have a lane taken away? No. Okay. That's not contemplated. No. Where will the staging area be for this construction then? I, I can't answer that, but I could. Is there someone here with you this evening that can? Stage, staging uh, will have to happen.
days as they are delivered. And once a truck is delivered, it will be, for example, for steel, it would be unloaded and immediately erected. Okay, but then just as a follow-up to Ms. Newcomb's question, then there will be no changes in traffic patterns outside of something incredibly temporary during the construction and demolition. I believe there are some individuals here who would like to uh, to speak concerning this. Anyone here that would like to offer any testimony? You raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Yes, I do. Could you please state your name, spell your last name if you would, and your address? Sure. Drew Simpson, S I M P S O N, twenty seven fifteen Price Street, Scranton. Uh, I'm here to testify today. Uh, I am a representative of the Carpenters Union here in town, and uh, at this point, we have a very high out of work list. And this project, uh, as all of the University of Scranton projects have in the past, will employ hundreds of local construction workers uh, that make a family sustaining wage. And uh, at this point in time, uh, the way the economy is, uh, that would be you know, a huge uh, benefit to us and to our members and to all of the people who are unemployed uh, in all of the building trades, not just the Carpenters Union. And uh, I think as been stated here today uh, by everybody that's testified, uh, this project does fall within the limitations that uh, uh, Attorney Lavelle and uh, Mr. Himmler have said that uh, you know, this would be a great project for us, for the building trades, for all the working people in the trades. And uh, you know, we respectfully ask that this get passed tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Anyone else would like to offer any testimony, please? Would you raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Would you please state your name and address? My name is Rick Schrader. Uh, I live at 11 Barber Lane in Taylor, but I'm the president of the Scranton Building Trades. Uh, and could and you I'm spell your last name, please? Last name is S C H R A E D E R. And I'm here to also state that we believe that the project, we know that this is the zoning board, and we think that it would fall within the confines of what is presently there, if not better. We do think that the project would be a very uh, uh, good project for, for the citizens and the city of Scranton. We think that there would be a lot of uh, benefits that would come from the permits that would be taken out, a lot of benefits that we would see from you know, the people that will continue to work there, pay taxes there. We think that it could be a positive impact uh, throughout the city. Uh, we believe that you know, it's a, a project that's going to be built on property. It's already owned by the university, and if you know, the, there's no obstructions for uh, the zoning, other than uh, some of the things that's already been stated, we, we certainly ask for your uh, consideration for the jobs that would be created by this and the positive impact it could have in the city of Scranton. Thank you. Any questions? Is there anyone else to offer any testimony? And we have no further questions. Would anyone like to make a motion? I'll make the motion. Yes. Do I have a second? Second. Motion made and seconded. Mr. Wallace, could you please take a vote? Mrs. Newcomb? Uh, no. Mrs. Wardell? No. Mr. Barnicki? No. Mr. Stangy? Yes. Mr. Coaches? Yes. By a vote of three to two, your application is denied. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wallace, could you please call the next case? Kinswood Manor Real Estate Associates, 117 North Main Avenue. The applicant is seeking a use variance to convert a personal care home to a residential drug and alcohol treatment center at 929 Cedar Avenue and R2 Zone.
We have the next one coming up, Mr. Hamler, so please. Mr. Chairman, I just want to say on the record, I have to recuse myself from hearing this due to the fact that this attorney is also my attorney and my family's attorney. All right. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before the board tonight on behalf of my client, uh, Penswood Manor Real Estate Associates. Uh, my name is Chris Cullen. I'm a local attorney who represents them. In our, <clears throat> excuse me, a uh, little bit of an allergy problem. I have to clear my throat. Uh, in our application, we have uh, provided to the zoning board uh, not only our application and an, an attachment uh, setting forth the justification for our request, um, and it provides a, I believe, very uh, complete background on the purpose of our application, uh, which deals with uh, a request for variance due to hardship. I believe that sections uh, C and D of our uh, attachments sets forth our position rather well. We also have supplied to both the zoning officer and the zoning board solicitor uh, a copy of an addendum of our current license to operate uh, a facility which is known as a inpatient non-hospital drug-free facility for Cedar residents who rents, excuse me, leases the first floor and basement of the building that is owned by my client. And I would also make reference to, and I would like to have incorporated into the record of this matter, uh, the uh, findings of fact and conclusions of law of this zoning board issued in a uh, matter involving uh, Cedar Residence Inc. Uh, in September of 2011, number Z-11-0027 as well as the transcript of that hearing uh, that was conducted here in council chambers on September 14th, 2011, and uh, dealing with an application for variance submitted by, at that point in time, Cedar Residence, Inc. Um, so I believe the application is complete in terms of providing the board with the background of why we're asking for this, uh, for this variance. And it's predicated on a hardship con uh, con uh, concept uh, that there is no other use of the building available to my client other than the use my client is, is having the building put to at this point in time under the zoning code. Um, just to give you a, qu a quick background on the building before I bring in any witnesses, it's at 929 Cedar Avenue. It's a former school district building. It was built to serve solely as a school district building. Um, in 1986, uh, this board uh, granted a variance to allow that school district building, which had then become vacant due to a change of school uh, property, to become a personal care home. And that personal care home was operated there for some time until recently. Um, and now my client is looking for a variance to be able to uh, use the facility for a step-down unit. In the ordinance, it's known as a treatment center, drug and alcohol treatment center, but it's really a step-down unit as the transcript of the September 14, 2011 hearing goes into great detail. It is non-drug, uh, uh, inpatient uh, facility, which provides an opportunity for those recovering from the uh, life-threatening disease of alcoholism, to be able to have a residence, a place to stay, work, 
seek counseling and receive counseling, both not only counseling in terms of personal issues and uh, recovery issues, but also job and training, and to be able to reintegrate themselves into uh, uh, our community and our society. And it is a wonderful opportunity for people to uh, come out of a treatment center such as a Marworth or a, uh, a Queerbrook or some uh, facility like that and have the opportunity to uh, strengthen their sobriety for periods uh, running from 30 to 90 days. Uh, in, in support of our uh, request for a variance based on hardship, which is uh, in your, uh, in the zoning ordinances section 11.E.3, they're the qualifications that we have to, uh, suffi uh, to meet, and that's taken from, of course, the uh, Municipal Planning Code 53 PS section 10910.2. Uh, we believe that there is an unnecessary hardship with the building due to the particular nature of the property, uh, that the physical characteristics of the building were not created by the applicant. Actually, it was the historical nature of the use of the building. The circumstances of the building are unique and particular to the property and not a condition common to the neighborhood in, in, in the immediate area in the sense that the building was built in that neighborhood God only knows how many years ago uh, to serve as a school. Uh, the, various is, the variance is needed by my client to make uh, reasonable use of the property and the denial of the variance would for all intents and property, render the pro property almost, all intents and purposes, render the property almost valueless. Um, the, the variance will not have a negative impact of, on the neighborhood. In fact, it would act as a stabilizing effect to allow the building to continue to operate. The building's three floors, 10,000 square foot of floor. Uh, it has a basement of equal size. Um, it has been, uh, uh, used uh, now as, as uh, Cedar residents. It has a top number of possible uh, uh, clients there of 25 according to the state license um, and that there are uh, uh, staff available on a 24-hour basis there and um, it is a controlled uh, and somewhat uh, regulated atmosphere. Uh, and uh, the variance here would be the least intrusive uh, solution for this concern because it would afford the relief requested, uh, maintain and stabilize the neighborhood and provide um, a basis uh, for um, not only uh, continue, uh, continue operation but also uh, uh, employees, salaries, uh, taxes and that type of thing. So um, I believe it's covered very well in our application which I trust all board members have received by now. And I would like to uh, bring up uh, my first witness, if it's, if it's all right. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dave Rubico, please. Uh, much like Mr. Lavelle, may I sit here and ask Mr. Rubico a question? Yes. I don't have any easels or anything. That's a tough act. That's <laughs> <laughs> Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Would you please state your name and address, and please spell your last name? Um, my name is Dave Rubico. Uh, my address is 154 Wilcox Street, Plains, PA, and it's R-U-B-B-I-C-O. Thank you. Uh, I'm a licensed real estate broker in the state of Pennsylvania. And uh, how many years have you been a licensed real estate broker? Uh, I've been a licensed real estate broker since 2005 and a real estate agent since 93. I presently own and operate my own uh, business, which is Realty World, Rubico Real Estate, and Plains, PA. We also have, um, under our umbrella, r, r Property Management, which manages over 200 uh, rentals and investment properties. Mr. Rubico, do you have any experience in the public sector? Uh, yes, I do. Could you explain that to the board? Uh, back in 1980, I was elected uh, township commissioner in Plains Township. Um, 
I was uh, township commissioner for the zoning and uh, planning commission, and I also was for recreation. I was appointed to that too. Uh, so you have experience in zoning issues, planning issues, sir? Yes, I do. Uh, do you have any other experience? Do you have experience perhaps in construction? Uh, yes, I was in the local unions for over 25 years. I uh, worked on various projects such as uh, the arena in Wilkes-Barre, um, the airport project, uh, CMC project, Marywood project, um, the list goes on. Um, they're just to name some of the few that I've been involved with. Mr. Rubino, Rubico, what is the primary focus of your occupation? Uh, I'm a licensed broker. Um, I mainly deal with investors to that invest in various projects from a single home all the way up to uh, apartment buildings, malls, whatever, um, strip malls. Now, as to the property located at 929 Cedar Avenue, have you had the opportunity to inspect and tour that property? Yes, I did. And was that recently? Uh, yes, it was. And based on your experience, uh, did, you, did you come to any conclusions about it? Uh, yes, um, it's in relatively good shape. Uh, it's well maintained. It's very clean. Um, uh, maintenance level on a scale of one to ten, I'd say about a nine. Um, it, it's pretty. It's utilized probably at the best of it. It can be uh, as far as uh, um, the age of it it's 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 up there in age i mean it's it's seen better days but i mean as far as uh the building itself it's in really good shape and did you do any research on the immediate neighborhood surrounding yes i did and what did your research uh, reveal to you uh what i did was i went in like say a five or six block area of the the facility itself mainly like cedar ave and stuff there's quite a few um residents and businesses that are vacant on that street um, approximately in the neighborhood of commercial and residential uh, using the Scranton MLS and you know the Realty uh, uh, database there's about I'd say 20-25 properties not counting um, the properties that are in foreclosure and pre-foreclosure that I know of uh, as maintained and operated, does the building have, what type of effect does the building have on the immediate neighborhood? Uh, from my observation and opinion, it has a very positive effect. It's, like I said, the outside is very presentable. It seems like more of a cornerstone. Uh, there is a vacant business next to it, but uh, I think it's a cornerstone of, of the area. I really think it does. I, be, I because of you know the jobs that it, it supplies, um, and basically what it provides for the community. Uh, based on your experience in zoning and planning, uh, in your opinion, is the grant of variance in this matter uh, uh, within within the uh, within the parameters of uh, the zoning code? Uh, yes. Uh, with the grant of, of a variance uh, in this, let me change that question. Let me rephrase the question. Let me strike that. Uh, in your opinion, based on your experience as you become for the board, what would happen if, to the building and probably the immediate neighborhood if, in fact, uh, the variance was denied to the use of that building? Uh, in my experience, in it happened a lot in my construction background where we went in to distressed properties. It probably a vacant property is just, uh, especially in this economy and market, is basically like a target for I don't want to say undesirables, but like homeless people. Uh, uh, theft is great. I mean, them you know removing copper or anything that's valuable from the property. 
especially a building of this size because there's multiple entrances. They know this. Uh, it's harder for our law, enf law enforcement to track them down because there's 50 different ways of getting out of a building such as, instead of just like a single home. So they do attract um, the homeless because it's, uh, it's just such a big building. I went through it twice a day. Just the cost of uh, factor in, in renovation of the building uh, would be tremendous, but the location of where it's located, um, the top scale type of building uh, renters that you would want, uh, I don't think it'd be feasible, not only because of all the money, but there's limited parking. Uh, I don't feel there'd be enough parking, and to renovate it, to make it, uh, like condominiums or something for uh, an upscale uh, uh, project, um, I don't think the area on the, in the south side would support it because it seems to be more commercial than residential. In your, in your opinion, sir, uh, without a variance, could that property be made in a single or multiple family house as permitted in the in this economy, I don't think it's feasible. Uh, there's too many other properties um, in the city of Scranton. Um, I think right now there's over 550 properties that are vacant that I know of uh, between residential, commercial, and multifamily. Um, it's, the investors are looking for the properties that are the easiest ones to turn over uh, to think a project like this would take to make it would take millions of dollars and right now in this economy there's too many other buildings out there that are more feasible in like are newer you know because of the old constructions and the walls and the floors it's just really not feasible Final, sir. I, I believe so. I really do. Uh, buildings of this nature, um, with the residents that they have in there and stuff, are what I could see was, was very well supervised. And that's basically one of the key things with any big complex buildings like, like it is. Um, without the supervision, it deteriorates really fast. And because I've seen a number of counselors and people working in there. Um, I think the building is probably best suited for what it's doing now. I mean, I didn't even realize there was that many people in the building, and I walked around it for maybe two and a half hours. So from my observation, I think it's, it's perfect for what they're doing with it. I do. What is the building currently being used for? Uh, step down unit a step down unit that's all that's in the building right now it's a step down unit nothing else is in that building so they have no patients there no. It's a, it's so how many floors are empty then And the third floor is empty? Most of the second floor. How long has it been empty? Third floor? Mm hmm. Uh, I don't have time for you. I think it's It was a personal care facility, correct? Yes. Okay. So I'm just wondering how long it's been empty because right now it's. The testimony so far is that it's not, used, not usable for anything other than a step down unit. I mean, it was a personal care facility. It could still be a personal care facility, or it cannot. Is, is his testimony telling me it can no longer be a personal care facility? I'm sorry. Is his testimony basically saying that it cannot 
be used as a personal care facility? That's not my expertise, personal care facility. I don't know. But you're making a recommendation I, that yeah, it I'm, would be good for a well, step-down facility, which is still housing, I, correct? No, what I said was, in my observation, I seen what transpired in the place. It's uh, a building with uh, a lot of people in it in, in separate rooms. I've seen where they had uh, R2, uh, where they rented the rooms out, the facilities, and the, the, not only the area, but the, the building deteriorated because there wasn't any supervision. What I seen, which was a plus in my opinion, was it was well supervised, and there was a lot of people there taking care of, uh, you know, the residents there and keeping it maintained and clean and stuff. I mean, the place is immaculate. How far did you go down Cedar Avenue? Uh, all the way to the end. Um, notice new construction? Pardon? Did you notice new construction on Cedar Avenue? Uh, the housing project? Are you talking about? Is that what you're talking about? The townhouse about? is being built. The townhouses, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you notice renovations on Cedar Avenue? Yep. Okay. So it, it's not exactly going downhill. It's well, moving in the other direction. Um, if you get closer to where the facility is, there's, I think, seven businesses that are vacant, and up, uh, I know three of them that are up for sale. Uh, there's uh, uh, a couple warehouses there and stuff on Cedar Ave right in the beginning, like two blocks down. So there is quite a few vacant businesses, plus there's quite a few, I think there's about 14 vacant buildings there too. Where were the warehouses two blocks Park? down? What warehouses? I'm not sure the name of them. I don't have my uh, clipboard with me, but there was, um, I'm trying to think of the name of them. Uh, there were businesses, uh, you know, big, what I was trying to do is compare that big brick building to the other ones that were down there. And, um, the other ones would have been about four blocks away down on, yeah. uh, by Smith's Restaurant. Right. They're not empty. Uh, no, I know they're not. Okay. But Smith's, I think the the eatery and clubs uh, empty. There uh, the facility right next to uh, Penswood is is empty. Okay. Did you go down? Uh, I went down Maple. Went Maple, down Maple. There's. Uh, Did you notice a school down there? Uh, where? South on, South Grant Intermediate yeah, on yeah. Maple Street. Okay. okay. On Maple Street. Yep. Yeah. I went up and I went up to Pittston Ave, up that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I did the whole area and I, I try to bring everything relative to the place that would have an effect on, you know. Okay, and you don't think this facility would have, in your opinion, any effect on that school? No. Mm -mm. You uh, also said if it became vacant, it would be easy to break in because there's many exits to it. Well, that's, from my experience, not only as a real estate broker, but as a construction laborer who ran the crews that demolished buildings and went in there with hazmat and stuff, that they were focal points. Okay. They were focal points uh, because, like I said, they're easier to think. I uh, I have relatives in police department, but it's just hearsay that they look for the bigger buildings. Yeah. Okay. I don't. Does anybody else have any I questions? Do, Feel Mr. Free. Cullen, this currently is used as a step-down facility. Yes. There's 25 beds used. Yes. Are there any people living in there that are using this as a personal care facility? And the reason it cannot be used as a personal care facility is because the owner doesn't want to use it as a personal care facility? I don't know And I, 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 don't want to, I don't want you to think that I, I don't agree that these things are very necessary. And I believe in these step-down facilities. But I do not believe that they belong in a residential area. You have the school there. You have kids running back and forth. You may say that, you know, they're not going to bother children and, 
and that's okay, but people that are going into these facilities are having a very, very difficult time readjusting. Yeah, yes, it is true. It's very hard to get back after you've been in a facility like Marworth or, or Clearbrook. It is a life-threatening disease. I agree with you. When you say that, I think you do a disservice to anyone who is trying to change their life, free themselves from a life-threatening disease, and to become sober, productive members of our society. And you see, I'm speaking from experience. So am I. And, and I, I believe that it's very difficult to get back into the groove of things. And I just don't believe that a residential area is not threatening to anyone else. There's not a single police report. Tell me how the, okay. I'm not here to argue with you. Tell me how this is going to stabilize the neighborhood, which is what Mr. Rubico said. This will stabilize the neighborhood. How does it stabilize that neighborhood? Because it's a, f a functional building, okay, which provides jobs for the community. It's well kept. It's taken care of. That's how it becomes, uh, I feel, a cornerstone of the community. There's so many buildings out there with the absentee landlords. And I mean, I could go on and on and on and tell you what causes uh, communities to deteriorate, okay? But when you have a, a property that's well taken care of, supervised, uh, well maintained, okay, uh, doesn't put a burden on the community with parking and, and uh, maybe some other uh, burdens that uh, businesses do put on, uh, that's what, how I, that's what I feel is a stable part of the community. It doesn't affect anything else. I think that I think that neighborhood is stable as it is. Pardon? I believe that neighborhood is stable as it is. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's a, a a valid part. I mean, it it's a good service. I mean, it is a good service it in really its place. Is. Yes, I agree with you. It is a good service in and, its and, place. And, and, and it's something that helps the community. I I believe any. I'm not against any of the facilities out there because I personally seen what they could do and how they help the community. And that's what it's about. And it, when you have a, a landlord that takes care of his property and does everything within his power to make it better and have a vital business, in this economy, it's, it, I think it's a stable, shows a stable cornerstone for the community. That's okay. just my opinion, though. I have no more questions. Any other questions? Just a um, point of clarification, I guess. Um, what is your relationship to the facility? Like, do you have any no. fiduciary interest no. at all? You're just here offering testimony? No. no. They, can't, they contacted me to, to do this, and that's what I'm here for besides, because of my background. Understood. Okay? Thank you. Mr. Yeah. Cullen, would you like? Yes. Would you like to call the next one, please? Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Please state your name and address. Could you spell your last name, please? Uh, Robert Hughes, H-U-G-H-E-S, at 155 Landestore Road in Boyertown, Pennsylvania. Mr. Hughes, uh, just to get a, a matter out of the way. Uh, are you from, I'm handing him a copy of the transcript from the meeting in 2011. Are you familiar with that transcript? Yes, sir, I am. Were you at that meeting? Yes, sir, I was. And you testified at that meeting? Yes, I did. And did you uh, have a chance to review that testimony before the Yes, I have. Do you stand by that testimony? Yes, I do. Uh, for the purposes, uh, Mr. Pinnacar, mm -hmm. solicitor, for the purposes of this authenticating the transcript, uh, I'd like to have this moved into the record. 
Yeah, I think at the beginning of the hearing you had asked for yeah. the uh, transcript to become part of the record, and, and I, I have no problem with that. Okay, I just wanted to affirm it through someone who testified. Sure. Uh, Mr. Hughes, you're, you're here tonight on behalf of the applicant, aren't you? Yes, I represent uh, Penswood Manor Real Estate Associates. And they're the owner of 929 Cedar Avenue? They are the owner of 929. Yes, I was. Would you be so kind as to uh, answer Mrs. Cordell's question about uh, personal care aspects? Is that, is that your question now? Yes. Okay. Do you want to ask? Well, I, I'd like to get your question answered. I asked why this couldn't continue to be a personal care. Do you have an answer to that? Yes, I do. Uh, the facility itself was uh, leased by Penswood Manor which operated a licensed personal care home. The physical plant met the regulations of the Department of Public Welfare, but because of the client mix, it was, uh, they were unable to sustain economically uh, the operation. The current reimbursement for a resident from the state of Pennsylvania is uh, a little over $1,000 a month. And it was costing the operator close to $1,500 a month to provide the care required by the regulations. So it became evident to them that they could not continue to operate a personal care home at that location. This is not uncommon in the state of Pennsylvania. 35% of all the personal care homes in Pennsylvania have closed in the last two years because the reimbursement rate has not been increased in five years. And with the current state budget, it's unlikely that it's going to be increased in the future. So the operator decided that the losses were just too great to bear, and uh, they, they terminated their lease, leaving the uh, owner of the building without a tenant at that particular time. So the reimbursement for this step-down facility is much greater? It is, it is significantly different, as are the regulations. Uh, a economically viable business is a combination of income and expenses. In this particular case, the <coughs> operating income for an individual who's being serviced at uh, the step-down unit is uh, close to $3,000 a month compared to a person in a personal care home who's receiving state assistance at $1,000 a month. So it's triple the revenue for that particular uh, service that is there. It's also a different type of clientele. Personal care homes tend to have people who are frail and who need assistance, which requires an additional number of staff people, a larger number of staff people as uh, compared to a step-down unit where the individuals tend to be younger and their services being provided are counseling services rather than physical care services. So there's a difference in the actual cost of, of running uh, a facility. So the economics, the metrics of the economics plays more positively towards a step-down unit than it would a personal care home. So, sir, just to be clear, uh, is it is it your testimony that it cannot be used as a personal care home because of economic hardship my 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 uh, uh, testimony is that the individuals who were leasing the building at that time could not make it economically i'm not saying that somebody else couldn't but they would have to be able to come in and be able to attract private pay residents at a much higher rate than the state supplement and the studies have indicated that it's unlikely that individuals with assets who can afford to uh, move into a care center in the suburbs would be willing to move into South Scranton uh, when they have other options that are available to them. The step down unit, is that completely uh, subsidized by the state then? There, there's only two sources of, of payment uh, for the care that's given there. One is through the Medicaid system. And that, is, that is paid through uh, a, um, a third party uh, uh, central payment system the Commonwealth and the counties have contracts with and also pri somebody who's paying privately. So there, there are two sources that are there. Pre predominantly, uh, the vast majority of individuals are coming there 
because of their addictions uh, don't have the assets that are capable of, for them to uh, go to a facility uh, that would be an all private pay facility. There are several in the Commonwealth, but none in this area. And they can stay in this facility for up to 90 days, is that correct? Yeah, that is correct, up to 90 days. And is there ever exceptions made for that? There, there can be uh, applications made. I've not seen them. I'm not, uh, I'm not an operations expert in the area of step down unit. We do have somebody here who could answer that question more efficiently and effectively. And of the 25 people that are currently there, have they been there before? Uh, I'm not aware of any recidivism at the current time. Uh, the questions I had were to see if anybody was currently there other than the step-down unit. Yeah. I okay. just want to correct the record as far as the building itself has three floors. Right. The lower level, which we call the ground floor, uh, is currently used for a dining room and there's a kitchen on that floor. The first floor, which is the middle floor, is where the uh, uh, residents of uh, of the facility live. That's where their bedrooms are, that's where their counseling suites are, that's where uh, the day-to-day -day operations are. On the second floor, which is the top floor, there is a portion of that floor which houses the corporate office for Foundation Healthcare, which is the parent company of Cedar Residence, uh, and the rest of that floor is vacant. All right. But as your testimony says, the building could be used as a care facility. It, it it's needs, just not as profitable to the former. Uh, it, okay. it would be, uh, it would meet uh, the current regulatory requirements. Uh, but since there has not been a personal care home in there for uh, a period of time, they would have to go through the Department of Labor and Industry in Harrisburg, and they may have some additional requirements that I am unaware of. So I hesitate to give you an absolute answer that yes, it can be used for step down unit. I can tell you the building meets yeah. the Department of Health regulations for a step down unit. How long has it not been used for personal care? The, uh, the tenant uh, decided to cease operating there uh, about 24 months ago. All right, thank you. Okay. Do you raise your right hand, please? You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Would you please state your name and address? Thomas Lavelle, 116 Columbia Street, Music, Pennsylvania. Spell your last name just L to make sure. Lavelle, L A V E L L E. Thank you. Mr. Lavelle, can you please tell the board how you were employed? Excuse me? I'm sorry. Can you please tell the board how I'm the facility director. And did you were here when the question was posed by Mrs. Wardell about the issue of uh, residents staying there for 90 days and whether or not what was that to I asked if they were ever given exceptions. To stay more than 90 days. Um, there's a, a managed care system. It's an insurance system that's funded by Medicaid. And depending on the client, it's individual. It isn't, um, it isn't um, one size fit all, fits all thing with um, the managed care system. They will, we will give um, a report to them every so often, an assessment of how the client is, is um, moving through. Um, our program, and and we we will we will let them know, and and between the counselor's suggestion, 
and the managed care caseworker, they might have they might offer an extension. Yes. So your goal in this facility is to bring someone that's been, let's say, at, let's say Marworth, okay? Okay. They're going from Marworth to your step-down facility. And at that facility, you're giving them counseling in regard to what? Um, drug and alcohol, uh, life skills, meaning like financial um, employment. Um, we, we get them up to um, career link in, in various places and we teach them how to open up bank accounts and start getting with the we we let them know in the beginning you have 90 days here the state is investing money in you guys in in this program for you guys to move through get out of the welfare system and in, into society that's productive members of society so that's it, it's a, there's a whole conglomerate of, of skills that we're teaching them, but basically, yes, it is. If you stop drinking and doing drugs and get into these programs that we, we are suggesting that you move into and that we're getting you to and, 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 and focus your life on, on treating the alcoholism, the chemical dependency, and you, you, become, un, you become employable, you're able to be a father, you're able to go back and, and repair relationships and, and yes, so there's a Do they, or is it possible, or do they have to get a job before they leave there? Yes, yes. Um, we, we have phases, and um, the first phase is like a, the initial phase where we, we have a, like intense, they, they, get, they become acquainted with our program. And then within two weeks, we want them, within the first week and a half, actually, we want them looking out job searching and and yes that's basically it's, a, it's step down the unit it's it's there it's not a flop house you're there to work and, and get ready and put money away and get ready to move on and what are the re the rules regarding when they can go when they can come back come in do they have set limits in other words do they have to be in at midnight or we, can they come and go as they please, or do you lock the doors at a certain time and say they can't get in after that? Or the doors are locked at 11 o'clock. Okay. So um, we get them out to their 12-step um, meetings throughout the city. We transport them. We don't have. There's no one is allowed to walk the streets of Southside or Center City or anywhere else. Um, there are passes allowed, and, and we we have um, the passes are approved by the counselor. And it, it, it's either a family member or somebody who has been a member of a 12-step recovery group for a period of time. And we know them, and, and there's a contact number, and there's a set hours if you're going out from 11 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We call and check to see that you're there. We, call, we have the contact number. It's a landline. Um, if you're going home to your mother's house, we're talking to your mother, whatever it is. We, we're constantly checking on their honesty. Do you have NA or, or uh, AA meetings at that facility? Yes, we, we have. Um, we offer one on Sunday night at 7 o'clock. And we offer um, another one at Sunday at 1030, I believe it is. Are they open to the public? They're open to the public, yes. Um, as far as public participation, it's not as great as something like that would be down at the, the icebox complex or something. It's just but maybe people are not aware of it. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But we do, we do get a lot of help from other groups. They'll come in. It's, it's part of the inner group of, of the 12th the step, and they send people in, they set it up, and they, they deliver the, the meeting to the, the men. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Sure. Uh, has the facility uh, had any interaction or any involvement with that school at all? Um, every morning I pull up at 5 to 8, 10 to 8, and there's 16 kids sitting on the front porch drinking chocolate milk and eating crackers, and they are not afraid of me. And Sal, the 
the gentleman with the, the crossing guard, waving to me every day. I, I talk with him. He's a, like we we are very well. Um, nobody is afraid of us. We are, we have not we are we have nothing to make anybody afraid of. We're not doing anything to make anybody afraid of us. You know. No, we, we have a we have a policies and procedures manual that the state regulates us. I have a personnel policy guideline that I regulate the staff with, and we have a client handbook that we regulate the clients with. And part of the client handbook is is we are neighbor friendly, and we're constantly monitoring our our clients' behavior. They go into the gym, it's in the back next to the alley. We're well aware that there's a couple houses back there. And you know, you're, they're, they're, they like loud music. And, I, and, and we'll come in and say, guys, neighbor friendly, it's in the book, let's you know, put it at a decent level. But as far as wandering the neighborhood, no. Um, does it happen? Um, not as far as I know, without permission. Without permission, no. Do they, they'll ask if they could walk up to the store. I had a gentleman that used to ask if he could go take a walk up Pittston Avenue, and I would absolutely write a pass, put it down, what time you're going, where you're going, and he would go up and he would come back. So we're well aware of their whereabouts. And um, if they do, if, if, if we do feel there's something wrong, we bring them in and we take care of it immediately. With respect to your uh, clients that use your facility, uh, are there any um, distinguishing characteristics or qualifications that would preclude them from seeking treatment there? Uh, criteria keeping them out? Yes. Yes. Um, most of it would be criminal, criminal history, um, although any use of drug and of any use of drugs is criminal, but there is no there is no violent offenders allowed. There is no sex offenders allowed. What the criteria is is um, is a drug and alcohol history, and and. But I, I'm looking for what would preclude some, what would prevent someone from prevent someone from coming there. Somebody yes. that cannot take care of themselves physically. Somebody that is. Um, mentally unstable or somebody that has a, a, a violent or sexual history. And how do you define that? How do we define it? The, the violent or uh, sexual history that you reference. Well, we, 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 we do backgrounds. Um, but what, what types of offenses, I guess, uh, would someone have to be convicted of in order to not be allowed to, <laughs> to seek treatment there? Aggravated assault or Attempted murder, strong arm robbery. Um, I don't know what you call that. Um, Assault. Is there a written policy or yes. something that spells this out? Yes. We have a policies and procedures manual with our criteria for, and we have a um, we have criteria that will keep you away. Is there keep a copy of that here, Attorney Collin? No, but I can make. I sure didn't. I didn't. I didn't bring it because uh, of I didn't think I would be up there. I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I'm not sorry, sir. I'm I will not sure if it was part of the prior record or not. No, I, I don't remember it being part of the prior record. I don't believe it was part of the record in the previous case, but if 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 the board requests and if the board wants it, I'll make sure that Mr. Penatar gets a copy of it tomorrow. Okay. I have a few questions. Uh, how long have you been working at this facility? I've been there since September 24th of 2012. What other facilities have you worked for similar? La Lackawanna County Treatment Court I was with for 12 years. Where are they located? Where is what located? Lackawanna County. I work for Judge Barres with the Lackawanna County Treatment Court, which is the drug okay, court. The treatment court, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, are there similar facilities to this in the city? Um, that I'm aware of, no. All right. A state licensed halfway house, no. How many are in the state? Um, I know of one in Edwardsville.
for males, and, and there's a couple of female facilities, and I'm aware of one called Colonial House in New York, Pennsylvania, and I'm aware of uh, treatment trends which is geared more towards criminal justice than it is towards um, men just coming in voluntarily from, the, from treatment centers. What kind of neighborhood are they located in? Um, treatment Trends is located in a similar neighborhood as um, Cedar Residence. And Edwardsville is, is Clemmar House, and they're located right in the same, same similar, right in the town. Well, I'm, I'm familiar with Edwardsville. Give me the location. The location? Yeah. I'm from Muzik. I don't know the street names. I don't know. I've been there. I've, I've done volunteer things there years ago prior to even learning about Cedar Residence. And um, so I'm aware that it's, it's on the main street. I don't know the name of the street, though. Well, main streets are much different depending on what city you're in. That's mm -hmm. why I was wondering well, where it was Well, it's a residential. Located. There's houses all residential. around it. There's houses all around it. Uh, is there a right school on. around it? Oh, yes, there is a school there. There's a, um, there's a town hall there. Everything that's here is there. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Do you have any other? Two more ladies, very okay. quickly. Uh, Mr. Paul Lodovici. Could you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help I you do. God? Could you please state your name and address and spell your last name for the record? Paul Ludovici, 414 Williamsburg Lane, Scranton, PA. Spell the last name, please. L-U-D-O-V-I-C-I. -I. Thank you. Mr. Ludovici, how are you employed? I'm a contractor, self-employed contractor. And have you done work for uh, the building located at 929 yes, uh, Cedar Avenue? Approximately for the last eight years, yes. And what type of work did you do there? Uh, renovations, uh, maintenance for the building, you know, minor uh, repairs, major repairs also, roofing, uh, just about everything they needed. Now, Mr. Lodovici, from your experience working on the site making repairs what's your opinion about the condition and status of the building well the condition of the building is very well it's uh, very well taken care of uh, I'm called whenever there's a problem to fix anything that needs to be fixed there's no problems on the outside of the structure or the inside of the structure uh, and Mr. Lodovici I'm going to present you with the document and ask you to take a look at it may I approach you? sure you can start up there, Chris. Thank you. So, what I mean is, I just handed you a document you'd like to have marked as uh, applicant one and ask you, have you seen that document before? Yes, I did. Could you read that document into the record, sir? Letter of support for Cedar residents. We, the neighbors of 929 Cedar Avenue, hereby support the request for variance to allow the building to be used for a non-hospital, inpatient, drug-free, transitional care setting. This program is a community-based step-down unit for men who have completed programs to regain control of their lives. The program is well monitored. It is drug-free and only treatment received by the clients is counseling and how to be productive part of society and remain in control of their lives. It is a fitting use for this building which is constructed as a school and after abandonment the school district was used as a personal care home for many years. Since Cedar Residence began its operations the building has been well maintained. There have been no problems associated with clients, staff or visitors at the property has been a Asset, uh, property has been an asset to the community compared to the vacant building, which could draw potential problems in lower surrounding property values. We urge the Scranton Zoning Hearing Board to approve this variance. Is there a series of, of signatures there, sir? Yes, there is. And did you, did you circulate that petition? Yes, I did. I walked around the neighborhood and spoke to the residents there. And Not, 
door to door. Did you watch the people sign those things? Yes, I did. And do you know the names? Yes. Uh, Could you please read the names? The names are uh, James Tallarico, 1000 Cedar Avenue, and I also have James Tallarico, 930 Cedar Avenue. He owns both properties. I have uh, Terrence Sanicero at 906 Cedar Avenue, and John Igniamo, I believe this the pronunciation is at 914 Cedar Avenue. These are all owners of properties directly across the street from this facility. Thank you. I have no further questions. Anyone have any questions for this witness? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask Mr. James Tallarico. Raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, I do. Do you please state your name and address and spell your last name for the record? James Tallarico, T-A-L-A-R-I-C-O, 1000 Cedar Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, okay. Mr. Tallarico, you just heard, did you not, Mr. Lodovici, testify as to circulation of this petition? Yes. And did you sign this petition, yes. sir? Yes. And you're a property owner across the street from the facility, sir? Yes, I caddy corner. Yes. Do you support the uh, grant of this variance that's being asked for the facility? Yes. And, sir, uh, from your observation, have you had a chance to observe the building, sir? Yes. Do you have any opinion about the building? <coughs> yes. Do you have any opinion about the operation of a step-down unit there, sir? Yes. And could you please share with the board your observations? Yes. I, I'm the property owner of Caddy Corner from the building. It's my family's residence for the last 15 years. And um, we've watched a nursing home there for 15, you know, it's been there since I'm there. And there's never been any trouble with the nursing home at all. The building's been well maintained. Grass has been cut, repairs have been made, bushes have been cut, signs have been repaired. And also since the nursing home is gone, and and the new people are in there. There hasn't, I haven't seen any problem, and I've asked Ann, who's there every morning, she goes to the bus stop, she's seen any problem, and she said, no, I just called her again before I came up here tonight. And um, I talked to Sal, the, the corner crossing guard, and I said, Sal, have you ever seen any problems? Because, you know, I'm interested to know what's going on. And he said, no, no, he hasn't seen any problems. And, you know, I, I hate to see that building become vacant. You know, it, it, it's a big building. There's somebody trying to do something there. If it becomes vacant, I don't see anybody that's going to want to take it over, maintain it. It's been maintained very well since I've been there 15 years. You know, and so I, I'd like to see, you know, with some kind of limitations, somebody in the building, rather than push somebody out that's taking care of it. You know, that's more, most what I could say. Thank you. I have no further questions. Mr. Tallarico, so you currently reside at 1000 Cedar Avenue? It's, it's my family residence, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Tallarico. Well, before you leave, since you opened it up, you said you would like to see somebody in there with limitations. What were those limitations? Well, uh, like, like you, I, I don't know who asked. Somebody asked what their rules were. You know, they, they're looking for the rule book of their facility. I don't know them. But um, do, are we open 24 hours a day? Do we come and go? I'd like to, you know, also know those things. Like you, the board asked those questions. You know, I have the same questions. But like I see, you know, we, we gave a variance for the ambulance down the bottom of the hill. You know, I was here. You, you, the zoning board allowed them in there. You know, there's no limitations on them turning that siren on, you know, 24 hours a day at that stoplight. You know, that's you know, so loud and noisy, but, you know, do, do we, are we going to allow somebody over there that's a bandstand? No. You asked what time the facility's locked up, 11 o'clock. That's what I mean by limitations. Do you know when the switch came from it being a personal care facility to a uh, treatment facility? I think within the last year, I, I know the nursing home was gone maybe about, 18 months, and I don't know exactly the exact time the treatment facility came in, but I know they've been there for the whole school year, I'm almost certain. 
for this past school year? For this whole past school year, yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Thank one you. final, <coughs> excuse me, sir. one final one. Mr. Vince Martino. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Would you please state your name and address, and please spell your last name for the record. Vincent Martino, M-A-R-T-I-N-O, 5391 Bloomington Road, Madison Township, 18444. Mr. I'm sorry. Mr. Martino, could you please tell the, bo tell the board your uh, occupation? I'm a certified construction manager in the state of Pennsylvania, and I'm licensed throughout the United States. And how are you currently employed, sir? I am the principal owner of BCM Construction Management in Glenmara, Music, Pennsylvania. Now, uh, very quickly, sir, um, and I appreciate you coming here this evening. You're familiar with this building at 929 Cedar Avenue? Yes, sir. And you heard, did, it, did you not, that uh, uh, the building consists of three, f three floors for all intents three and purposes. Three 10,000 square foot. Now, given your background and your experience, sir, do you have any idea or could you give the board an estimate of what you think it would run to convert that building into multifamily housing to comply with an R2 restriction? Yes. The average applu uh, application for renovation to that building would be anywhere from 125 to uh, about of 175 dollars per square foot, because of you know the size of the building and the limitation of the basement. You would approximately be looking at about a three and a half, three and a half to around 4.1 million dollars to renovate that building to make it a residential facility. And from your experience, is that a feasible, uh, uh, a feasible uh, investment to make in that building? Considering the amount of the square footage that you would need for each apartment and everything around it, you're probably looking at a 15-year loan of like, just say, $3 million. And a 15-year loan would payback would be close to $40,000 a month of that for 15 years. And you were here for the previous testimony, sir? Yes, sir. And did you hear uh, testimony regarding uh, the, the building and its current use and its current operation being a stabilizing influence on that neighborhood? Did you hear that, sir? Yes. Do you agree with that? Um, being from Dunmore originally in the area, it's better than it's being, it's better than being empty and it's my experience as an employer, I've employed these people coming out of the step-down unit out of Scranton, and it's, it works. It works. You've, we, did, I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. We've had several of the employees, uh, several of our ex-employees, uh, why they're ex, three of them are now in business. The, uh, the fourth one is working now with his father again down in Hazleton, and it's worked for us. So your experience has been that those people that you've hired, your firm has hired out of the step-down unit to work have been responsible and reliable and dependable? Yes, the, the step-down unit monitors their time with us because <coughs> my project managers basically have to turn in reports to what time they report to work, what time they get off of work, and we return that back to the step-down units for the first 90 days. Why do we do it? My younger brother went through the program uh, a long time ago, very successful for him, and I felt it was, uh, you know, it's something that I was interested in at that time. Thank you, Mr. Martino. Thank, Thank you. you very much, sir. Uh, I have, there's a question before we go any further. Um, did you employ people from this step-down unit? Is that what you're saying? No, sir. What step-down unit? The one that's on uh, across from the courthouse, um, I think, I'm, I'm trying to remember the name. It's been about six months since we, uh, our last gentleman left out of there. 
Um, the, it's managed uh, by a private contractor. Okay. That's not in a neighborhood, though. That's downtown. I just wondered, what, when I asked about were there other facilities, I thought we were told that there weren't any in the area that anybody knew about. I know of two in Luzerne County. I know of two in Hazleton, and I know of the two in Scranton. Are they located in neighborhoods? Or are they located in industrial areas or downtowns? Um, the one that I visited in Luzerne County and down in the Edwards area mm -hmm. is in a neighborhood. Okay. And the one in uh, Hazleton that I visited uh, was in a, uh, I would say within a block of a heavily residential area. I would not say like right on the block there was a commercial building next to it and then the residence started. Okay. Are you referencing the MinSec facility in Hazleton? Pardon me? Are you referencing the MinSec facility in Hazleton? Yes, sir. That's it. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Wallace uh, Mr. has a question. You know, was there any uh, renovations required to convert from the personal care home to the... I was not... I only handle large projects, sir. I, that, I think uh, they had another contractor doing that. I only deal with projects over a million dollars. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Mr. Wallace, is there anyone else you'd like to ask that question of? <laughs> not yet. Pardon me? No? I have no further witnesses, sir. All right, thank you. No other questions on this? All right, we shall open it up. Is there anyone in the audience here to offer any testimony? Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God? Yes, I do. Please state your name and address and spell your last name for the record. Uh, my name is William King. I reside at 1310 Ridgewood Avenue in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, K-I-N-G is my last name, and William is W-I-L-L-I-A-M. Okay. Um, this is Many of you know I'm also the superintendent of the Scranton School District, um, but I, I'm here tonight actually representing the Scranton School Board. Um, I'm representing myself as a resident. I'm also here um, representing the neighbors, and, and I'm a parent of a student that attends South Scranton Intermediate School. Um, I understand the, the, the need for facilities such as this, believe me. and I. I, I truly understand that uh, drug and alcohol uh, addictions are diseases and, and they need to be treated. And they need to be treated properly. Um, and, and truly, I'm not against the individuals that would be served in, in this facility at all. Um, my concern, as many of you had discussed earlier, is that the location of this uh, facility would be a half a block from South Scranton Intermediate School in close proximity to a, uh, a bus stop where children would be um, boarding a bus, young children. The children that attend South Scranton Inter Intermediate School are grades six through eight, which are ages typically 11 to 14. Um, I do have some concerns about the fact that it's not uh, a lockdown facility and that the residents can come and go as they please. Um, recently, I was involved with a, a cleanup project in South Scranton. Uh, my daughter is a member of, of the uh, uh, student council at South, and uh, one Saturday morning, we did a cleanup of that whole area. Um, as I was cleaning, along with my daughter, um, I did find a hypodermic needle not on the facility grounds, um, approximately, I would say, 60 to 70 um, meters in the back alley from the Penswood Manor facility. Um, also, um, it was reported earlier tonight um, that there were no police calls or incident reports um, at 929 um, Cedar Avenue. Um, I have an incident analysis report here which indicates that their police have been called to this facility 13 times since uh, January 6th of 2012. Um, with the incident types ranging from uh, drunkenness, disorderly, theft, trespass. And to be honest, I don't know what these other 
it, it doesn't spell it out, so I'm not going to guess at what the other incidents were. One of them, a couple of them were parking incidents, things like that. So I just wanted to, uh, that was handed to me tonight by some other residents. Um, also, I don't know if you're aware of the Pennsylvania Department of Health. There's a, a DNA facility performance profile that's conducted, that has been conducted at this facility, and they are conducted at all of the other facilities in the area. And I'll just give you a brief synopsis of the names of some of those other facilities, um, of which Cedar Residence is the only inpatient uh, facility uh, that I'm aware, aware of other than Marworth, which is located in Waverly. A Better Today is located, um, that's an outpatient drug and, uh, drug-free partial hospitalization program. That's in North Scranton. Um, I believe it's an industrial zone or commercial zone, 1339 North Main Avenue. Um, drug and alcohol treatment services at 441 Wyoming Avenue in downtown Scranton. Once again, that's uh, an outpatient um, drug-free uh, partial hospitalization drug program. Habit OPCO Incorporated, which is on Monaghan Avenue in Dunmore, I honestly can't say I know exactly where that's located. So Monaghan Avenue is up in the uh, is it industrial, industrial zone park or area. Zone? Okay. Um, Lighthouse Counseling Associates, that's on South Main Avenue in Taylor. Um, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, Lordsmont, uh, 1327 Wyoming Avenue. Um, that's apparently an outpatient. They deal with outpatient drug-free activities. We actually have a Lordsmont program in our schools, but it's not really related to drug and alcohol issues. It, it, it deals with students who are having emotional difficulties in school. Um, and then Marworth, which is located in, uh, in Waverly, which is completely secluded, and, and that is a residential uh, inpatient uh, non-hospital detoxification program. And PA treatment and healing, that's PATH, that's located um, back by the post office on Stafford Avenue, um, maybe a block or two from there. And actually, that facility um, houses some of the students um, that we've had, unfortunately, to expel or have had uh, difficulties in school. This report, uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Health, it's a DNA facility performance report. It indicates the number of um, let's see what we can, deficiencies. And the deficiencies range everything from confidentiality to client rights, client management services, medication control, intake, admission, discharge, treatment, um, project policies and procedures, client records, qualifications of the project facility director, full-time equivalent maximum client staff ratios, uh, building exterior and grounds, building interior, living, food service areas. Um, administration, miscellaneous, uh, fire emergency, and general safety. Those are pretty much most of the categories. And as I look at this performance report, it has the results for all of the facilities that I just mentioned. Um, the average number of deficiencies for um, the other seven, there's eight of them because Cedar Residence would be the eighth. The average number of deficiencies was 30 amongst the other seven. The average number of deficiencies for Cedar residents was 102, um, ranging from, uh, there's apparently some issues with medication control there and uh, issues with uh, client records, um, 15 with confidentiality, uh, three with client rights and, and client management issues. So that, that's obviously a concern as well. Um, if, if this, uh, zoning board were to grant um, this variance, it would be a concern that uh, they're experiencing all of these issues at that facility. Um, once again, I'm here out of concern for our children. I uh, fully understand and recognize the need for uh, such a program. Um, Attorney uh, Cullen did send me some information including a flyer or a brochure, uh, which actually, the title of it's called the Drug and Alcohol Halfway House. Um, I know they're calling it a step-down facility, but this is their brochure, they call it a halfway house. Um, I'm concerned for the health, safety, and welfare of our children. Um, I don't believe that this is the proper place for this facility. I'm not saying that there's not a need. I'm saying that there's probably 
better places, even better places within this city that could probably house a facility such as this. And that's my concern, and I thank you very much for your attention, for allowing me to speak here this evening. If anyone has any questions on anything that you know, I brought forth here this evening, I'd be glad to answer them. No? Um, Mr. King, I, I, just got, I just have one question for you. Yes. Um, in your opinion, do you think the treatment center would alter the essential neighborhood, the essential character of the neighborhood? I believe so. Um, actually, when that was Penswood Manor, that was the facility that we used to use for emergency evacuation place. Um, we no longer do that. I, I had a question too. I was wondering how can they currently, if, if they're not currently zoned for a step down program, is that correct? Correct. That's correct. So we how, were, we were how can they, the same thing. how can they function as such without the approval of this board? Is that? They needed to be served, I would assume, by the zoning officer. I was just wondering if there's total disregard for this board. Okay. And because I, ho I hope not, but sometimes there is. <laughs> that was a question I had just sitting here. Okay. I was wondering myself. I'm sorry. Mike could, Mike could um, give you the history. April, excuse me, <clears throat> April of 1986, a certificate of occupancy for a personal care home was issued. In, <clears throat> I'm going to say, the summer of 2011, I got complaints that it had been operated as a treatment center versus a personal care home. We did an inspection on the property and we found out that in fact it was converting to a, a treatment center. We filed letters the, the, uh, against them and the Pinswood Manor came to the zoning board in September of 2011 and they were denied the use of a treatment center. They put it on appeal to Lackawanna County Court and it just kind of got lost uh, in I'll, the shuffle. And I'll, I'll take it from there. Okay. Uh, eventually the Lackawanna Co County Court upheld the opinion the opinion of the uh, zoning board which would be to shut it down uh, once that opinion was handed down this new application's been filed so we're kind of in flux, in flux at this point and in, in just before um, attorney Cullen asked me a question the gentleman that just came up here to speak um, I believe he owns the property on the corner of Cedar Avenue and Maple Street is that correct Mr. Tallarico, I would believe, would be the name. Okay. I, I was just wondering, number one, does he live there? Number two, is anyone live there? Number three, has the place been condemned? His answer was it was the family home. He never, he never quite he never gave an answer as to whether he, anybody lived there. Those are just some, that, like, some questions that, that came to mind. Um, actually, some of the people that are here that live in that neighborhood um, we're wondering that themselves. Attorney Penitar, uh when did the uh, local court here render that decision? Mm, I'm going to say, uh, I don't want to say it's a month ago or two months ago, but it's in that range. Okay. Uh, it, may be, it may be three months ago. Okay. Thank you. Shortly, shortly thereafter, this application was filed. Your turn to ask questions. Thank you. Mr. King, you said you yes. found hypodermic needle in well, the back alley. That's correct. Sixty meters or so <coughs> from the property. What? What right? was it? Sixty meters or so from. No, the I said about sixty. <coughs> six oh. Sixty. Sixty meters. Yes. And how? For those of us who work. Half a football field, roughly. Half a football field away, and you're aware, of course that that alley has a lot of houses on it, right? Right, there's a, actually a garage, a large um, yeah. garage, which is um, actually adjacent to Penswood Manor, and that's where I found it, right in front of that garage. And that garage isn't part of Penswood Manor, is it? No, I never indicated that it was. And, well, the inference of your statement was that somehow that the hypodermic close proximity. needle got somewhere from that hypodermic needle, your inference was somehow that came from Penswood Manor. Okay. Or well, resident. let me let me say this. From reading your brochure, apparently, people that that do go to this new treatment facility, they talk about relapse prevention treatment. So I would imagine that some of the clients there would relapse, and well, you if they're. You also, also sir, got a copy 
I mean, there's, there's a lot of inferences that were made to that it's a non-drug inpatient, non-hospital facility, right? Absolutely. Yeah, you heard testimony that no medications are given out there, right? Yet in the report, it indicated that there were issues with medication. Well, that report doesn't say anything about what that means, does it? And I noticed quite... This one does. I noticed quite conveniently you haven't made that report available to the board or to myself. I just, this was handed to me when I walked so in here tonight. So you never saw it before somebody else handed it to you tonight. Someone handed it to so me tonight. So you don't tonight. know where that came from. No, it, it comes from right here, the Pennsylvania Department of Health. But I'll you, gladly make copies of it and provide it to the board. But you don't know what medication control means, does it, do you? Medication control, yes I do. Do you want me to read what it says in the report? Sure, go ahead. Okay, I'd be glad to do that. Okay, let's see, where's that one? Sure. Okay, here we go. Okay, 709.32, licensure, medication control. Based on the review of client records and facility communication logs and the medication administration record, the facility failed to ensure that medications are properly controlled and accounted for. The findings include, during the on-site complaint investigation, inspection of February 5th and 6th of 2013, six client records, the medication administration record, and the facility communication logs for the past three months were reviewed. The following information is taken from the MAR, which is the medication administration record. Client number four was prescribed sulfamethadoxol twice daily. Documentation in the MAR for January 11th and through the 14th of 2013 indicated that the medication was given only once. Client record number seven, the MAR indicated that the client was to receive Cymbalta 60 milligrams twice daily. The MAR did not reflect that this client received his medication on February 3rd, 2013. Client record number eight, the MAR indicated the client was to take 20 milligrams of Celexa daily. Documentation in the MAR indicated that the client did not receive this medication on February 4th, 2013. This client was also to receive Neurotonin, 300 milligrams, three times per day. Documentation in the MAR did not document that the client received his medication on February 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 of 2013. Client record number nine, the MAR stated that this client was to receive Prilosec, 40 milligrams, once per day. No documentation was in the MAR to reflect that the client got the medication on February 2nd, 3rd, or 4th of 2013. Client record number 10, the MAR documented that this client was to receive one tablet of Zoloft each morning. There was no documentation that the client got this medication on February 2nd, 3rd, or 4th of 2013. Client record number 11, the MAR documented that this client was to receive Pamelor, 50 milligrams, four capsules at bedtime. There was, there was no documentation that the client received this medication on February 4th, 2013. This client was also to be given Advair, 250-50, but no frequency was listed for use of this medication. There's no documentation in the MAR that the client received the medication. On 2-4-13, the project director and administrative assistant were asked if clients ever ran out of medication. The reply was that they never run out of medication. Entries in the staff communication log listed below indicated that clients ran out of medication or that documentation regarding client medication was not complete or properly communicated. Pharmaceuticals added to protect client identity or to comment on observations about documentation in the log. Otherwise, quote it directly. Unidentified pill in client number 12 envelope. Client identified pill as Romeron, disposed of pill, undated entry log, couldn't find client number 10, Romeron, 11-11-12, entry date was actually listed, client number 13, out of Amox, client number 14, out of Zerotech, 11-8-2012, uh, client 6, supposed to start Trabzdone, Trazodone tonight, but it wasn't logged in already. Client 15, prescribe antibiotics in his eligible word drawer. In the med cart, 
that they were not logged into the med book. Client number 10, out of Zoloft, 131, 2013, and out of uh, omeprazole, 40 milligrams. For, for an organization that doesn't dispense medication, you certainly got cited for an awful lot of things. Mostly cited for not giving medication, right? Well, you indicated that you don't give medication. You don't. And I'll oh. have Mr. Okay. I'll, I'd like to recall Mr. But, Tom Lavelle. But why, why would the Department of Health cite you for it? Well, then, why don't we have Mr. Lavelle, who's the, exec, who's the director of that? And if you would allow me, I'd like to call him back. Absolutely. You may call him back. Before you do, do you have any other questions of Mr. King? Oh, there's nothing in that Department of Health report that said that the facility is a danger to the children going to South Scranton Intermediate School, is there? I don't believe that that's part of what they do when they go out and, and perform Well, there's nothing in that report that problems. states that, no, does it? No, there's not. Okay, so how do you come up with the position that somehow having that facility located there is somehow, I guess the phrasing used, uh, not in the best interest or against the general public welfare of the children. Health, safety, and welfare of children. Yeah, how is that? Well, let's put it this way. Your own, your, your own um, flyer indicates that you know, we're dealing with individuals who are suffering and going through a difficult time with drug and alcohol abuse, and they're trying to... Uh, get themselves sober and get themselves clean. And I, I respect that fact. And I think that there's a great need for that and support that. But it also talks about uh, relapse. And we know that, you know, that happens all the time with people that suffer from drug and alcohol addiction, that in some instances, we're very, very fortunate, they'll, they'll be able to go through treatment and, and they'll be sober. But in many instances, and probably most instances, it's three or four times where these relapses occur. If these individuals are living in there, they're allowed to come and go as they please. What's to prevent them from having a relapse? That, that wasn't the testimony by the, executive, by the executive director that they can come and go as they please. Were you here for that testimony? I was here for that okay. testimony. Secondly. No, 11 o'clock they have to be in. Well, you also heard that they can't wander South Scranton aimlessly. Secondly, how is it that... Uh, but it's not a lockdown facility. It's not a lockdown facility, right. but they so locked the doors here for at that 11 o'clock. Right? Did you hear that? Were you here for that testimony? Yes. Okay. Yeah. They checking. locked the doors at 11 o'clock. Right. At pass. 11 p.m. That's correct. Right. Okay. Well, that's, there's now, a lot of time up children, until 11 are children, p.m. Are children at the bus stop at 11 p.m.? No, they're not. Okay. And you don't have are, any are police Are the residents report? allowed to be outside you don't at have eight, any police 8, 8 reports, a.m.? Mr. King? A little civility, please. Okay, let one person ask a question, let That's the other person answer it. We don't need bickering back and forth. That's what I'm trying to do. Good, then let's you don't you ask a question, let him complete his answer, and then we'll work it that way. You Thank you any very much. You reports indicating that the children of that school were somehow uh, endangered by anybody at that building, do you? Well, let me say this. No, answer the question, yes or no, do you have them? No, nothing indicates there was a problem with children. Okay. That's it. However, no further I will say this. I was sitting here during, during Attorney Cullen's testimony, which indicated there were no police calls to the facility. There were 13. Thank you. Yes, but I still don't even have that report. Thank you for coming. Excuse me, Mr. Uh, Penatar, can we accept that paperwork into the record or not? Attorney Cullen, would you allow your executive director to authenticate the reports from the Department of Health? Well, I'm going to ask him about that right now. If we have a copy, we don't know them. I mean, um, I don't have a copy. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna provide you with a copy right now. You're going to give it to Chris. I think the first question I have is whether or not your facility uh, dispenses medication because there seems to be conflicting testimony and I'd like to get some clarity on that. Our, our facility is a non-drug hospital, meaning there's no narcotics dispensed, there's no, but there's life-threatening, um, if somebody has a seizure disorder, they're going to have their medication, um, their medication is going to be prescribed from a the facility before they get there it's in a med cart we make it available it's a locked med cart and and 
it's, it's dispensed. They have their own drawer, they pull the drawer out, they dispense it into their own hand and they take their own dose and we, we monitor it. Okay, well, I, I'm gonna wait until Attorney Collins done reviewing that and then mm -hmm. follow up with uh, any other questions I might have after that, I guess. This is a police report. One six, one six, two thousand twelve. One twelve, two thousand twelve. One fifteen, two thousand twelve. I didn't. I'm not. Re, I'm not aware of any of this. Um, I I came to the facility in, as I said earlier, on uh, September twenty fourth, two thousand twelve. All right. So let me ask you this then. Um, since you've been there, just. To be clear, have the police ever been dispatched to that to 929 Cedar Avenue? No. Not that I'm aware of. No. Um, I, there's no police reports that I'm aware of or anything. No, I asked if the, just to be clear, if the police have ever been dispatched to 929 Cedar Avenue. You've never had a police officer in at that building for a um, complaint. I they, they knock at the door every once in a while, whether it's a sheriff or a police officer looking for somebody, but as far as dispatched on a complaint, there's nothing that I'm aware of. Looking for somebody for what? Sheriffs or, well, let's do well, sheriffs if, first. If, if, there's a, if there's a sheriff or there was a warrant for somebody's uh, arrest, like the court is very aware if so somebody- So process server. Excuse me? A process server showing to, to yeah, pick somebody if you, up? If you, if you have fines that weren't paid from whenever, whenever, wherever you came from, the court's well aware of your movements um, if, if you're on, in the Medicare or the Medicaid system. Sure. If their social security number, if they're looking for somebody for court costs, I answered the door once or twice for. Has uh, anyone ever been taken out of your facility uh, in the custody of law enforcement? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. And then as far as the visits by the municipal police officers, not process servers or? I, I had a, a Scranton police officer that I'm aware of once when I first came here. He was looking for a gentleman. There was an incident wherever it was. That this gentleman wasn't even um, involved in. It was between, it was his girlfriend. They wanted to see him down at, at the police station on South Washington, and that's the only, the only time a Scranton cop ever came to take some. They weren't taking somebody, they were looking for someone. And then with respect to the uh, testimony that was given uh, with the uh, Pennsylvania, I guess it was the Department of Health, the uh, yes. uh, concerns that were raised, are you aware of those? The, the MedCart, the, the, the people from the Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs are very thorough. And they come through, and they go through every, everything, not just the med card, they go through everything. Um, every personnel file, every client file, and they find stuff. And, and I, when I came in, I was brought in to, to do what I'm doing. Sure. And we had our last, our annual inspection in April. And we had five or seven, either five or seven, um, one of them were for air mattresses, air mattresses that guys snuck in to put on their beds. One were for fans. But these, these very well are, were, were, were served, these med card violations, um, deficiencies they're called. And Can you authenticate them? Yes. So um, that they, they weren't documented properly. And this is something that I came in and we're working on our staff with throughout the whole time I'm there. And, and then we give a plan of correction to the state of Pennsylvania, Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs, and they come back and they, they redo it and, and everything's okay and, that we're, and, and we follow their regulations. And they, they just were back in April, did an annual inspection, inspected us throughout and found nothing wrong. We, we corrected everything that they were looking for. All it was was when the client takes his medication he, he's supposed to initial it, date it, saying at, at what time, and um, it wasn't being properly supervised. Um, 
In other words, the community manager was taking it for granted that they wrote it down instead of standing there saying, okay, make sure it's written down. So this is something that with, with my staff, we're making sure that everything's documented, everything, every, every I is dotted, every T is crossed. And, and now it's corrected and our staff is working um, rigorously to make sure that the state is well just and again it's it's sort of difficult to to uh, do this without having the document in front of me but it seems as though that uh, explanation would apply to some of the deficiencies that were on there but uh, it doesn't seem like it would apply to all of them so you, your your testimony is that all of the incidences contained on that report uh, were uh, caused by a client uh, taking their medication as they should properly uh, but merely uh, neglecting to yeah, document it. it All of those it, it, on that document, every one of those are, are somebody got their medicine when they were supposed to. Sure. And uh, they just failed to initial it. So it, it wasn't properly documented. Okay. And, and that is our responsibility, and it's been corrected since. Right. Okay. Uh, may I ask a question? Mr. Yeah. Okay. These medications, uh, the client brings them with them, and they're prescribed by some doctor that the client sees. Is that right? Correct. They're not medications that are given out, meaning originating from Cedar Residence. Right. No, we are not a hospital. We are non-hospital. This is all coming from referral sources, uh, medical doctors. So if a, if a doctor prescribes, let's say I'm a client at yes. Cedar Residence, and I have uh, uh, epilepsy, let's sure. say. And so my epilepsy medication uh, prescription, I come in, and I, I'm going to go through your facility. My doctor will provide you with my epilepsy medication and a prescription on how it is to be uh, given to me. Sure. And so your job then is to make sure that I receive that medication. We, we have it in a cart, a med cart, which was talked about in, right. in the, the report. And everybody has their own drawer and your medication is in there. Whatever, whatever prescribed medication, right down to Prilosec, which is uh, antacid. Sure. Um, and it is administered by the client himself. Just like if you got a prescription and your doctor <coughs> gave you a prescription and it says take two, three times a day, and you take one in the morning, you take one in the afternoon, this is the same thing. They are prescribed, they take their own medication, and we just have it in a secure location. Oh, and we makes. document that they're taking it, and we have PRNs, which are um, medications that they could take if they want it. Like if they have a stomach ache, there is right. stuff available, but they don't have to. So, but everything needs to be documented, and that is something that we're striving to make sure that is is uh, is up to state regulations. Okay. Who makes up that medical cart? Who's responsible for filling the, that medical cart? The clinical director is in in charge of the medical cart. And is that? card available all day because there no are that card is in a secure location it's brought out at seven in the morning noon five o'clock in the afternoon and then nine o'clock at night okay. it's only it's brought out five times four times a day and other than that it's in a, it's locked up in an office in a closet with a, a deadbolt and it's locked down thank you very much I, I have one one more question before I just and this is my last well, that's fine Certificate of licensure. This one expired last year. Do you have a current one? Yes, it's part of our application. Uh, we okay. Have an addendum. Yes. Uh, here it is. May I approach? Sure. Well, while you're doing that, I think we can get the expired uh, health since he's, he's authenticated it as being true and correct. We'll make that part of our Except the police report. And additionally, was your application for an additional 15 beds approved? Yes, please.
Yes. I have no more questions. That's yours. the police incident analysis report for uh, Pinswood from January 1 to 12 to May 9th this, uh, of this year. And this was given to me by a neighbor. I checked it with the police department. It is their printout. Uh, and the only one I can say is absolutely true is 5-2-2-13, second from the bottom was me because I took a police officer with me when I went to uh, talk to Mr. Lavelle about well, I ask four questions. How long have you been operational? How many residents do you have? When did you, uh, and may, do you have a, a state certificate? May I have a copy of it? So, that's okay. the only one I can testify here, Sue. But the police have been to Pinswood Manor. Thank you. Anybody have any other questions? I don't, I don't know what this is. Yeah, I, I'm looking at this and I see incident types and I see traffic, I see medical, I see mentally disturbed, I see uh, vagrancy, and I don't know if this is just happens to be the address of 929 on the street this happened or 929 within the building. So without, without the individual reports. It says report required and it says no for every one of them. Right. So there is no report. And well, the, I, I don't the know pins. if this is a, city, a street address or if it relates to the building, and it's not clear from this report if it's, if it's one or the other. So well, I, I would suggest that, well, respectfully so, that unless, unless there's some more verification than somebody handed this to me and the actual, actual officers are here to testify, I don't believe this can be admitted. We're, we're going to admit it for what it says. For what does it say? Nobody knows what it says. Sure, it's 929 Cedar Avenue. But it doesn't well, say. It doesn't say building or, or, or location. It's building but, but or it, it, a street address. Exactly. That's the only building at that address. Yeah. Yes, but that's true. But Yes, it could be in the street in front of the building. Exactly. That, that's, that's, that's and, and we'll admit it for exactly. that and, for that purpose. And we'll accept vagrancy it for that. Vagrancy is like they're not vagrancy mm -hmm. in our house. That's, that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Mr. Wallace. Yes. I, I'm not sure if you can answer this, but I'll ask anyway. Do you know under what circumstances uh, there would not be a report required for an incidence of, say, assault or you know any of these other things? I don't have a good answer for that either. I want to speak yeah. with the uh, Jossie at this department. She said uh, a report isn't required. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, anybody else here that has any testimony to offer? We'll start on the left side, the back row. If you're coming up, please do. Could you raise your right hand, please. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Could you please state your name and address and spell your last name? My name is Andrea Wharton, W-H-A-R-T-O-N. Um, I am the president of the Southside Neighborhood Watch. I am a UNCDC board member, and my daughter attends South Intermediate. She just graduated, but she did attend there. Um, we were here last month. We voiced our concerns and we were given a document by Mr. Cullen that if we choose to make further false defamatory characters whether representing the Southside Neighborhood Crime Watch or not regarding their client Cedar they will leave us with no other choice but to speak to seek legal regress for damages and harms caused by the remarks of the Court of Common Pleas of Lackawanna County. 
So I went and I did my research before coming. Um, I was the one that gave Mr. King the information about uh, Cedar residents uh, via the website, the Department of Health Drug and Alcohol Facility Surveys. And in my investigation, since 4-13-2011, this facility has never been in compliance. Um, they have had 413, 8-24, 9-14-2011, 10-5-2011, 12-12, 12-22-2011, 1-17-2012, 2-2012, 2-7-2012, 5-15-2012, 9-7-2012, 10-4-2012, 2-6-2013, and 4-10-2013. Um, I do have, and I'm sorry, I did not know I needed copies of everything. Um, but I do have most of the facility surveys here, and if I can, I will give you them after I'm done speaking about them. Um, one of my concerns is since they've never been in compliance, they have 25 beds now. They are going for 40. Um, that was provided to me in the attachment for justification for request. Um, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Department of Health Division of Drug and Alcohol Program License. Expansion of existing facility, current license, 25 beds, expansion to 40 beds. Um, if they can't handle with all of the uh, with all of the, ver the discrepancies that they've had, um, I can't see why they sh are going to go and go bigger. Um, one of the general requirements that in the survey of 2-6-2013, it, it was licensure general requirements for residential facilities. The observation, based on a review of administrative documentation and an interview of corporate compliance officer, the facility failed to provide documentation demonstrating that it was in compliance with the local zoning codes. The findings include the facility administrator, administrative documentation was reviewed for the documentation of compliance with the local zoning ordinances on February 5th, 2013. No documentation of zoning approval was among the administrative materials reviewed. The compliance officer was interviewed on February 5th, 2013 and acknowledged that zoning for this facility had not yet been obtained from the local zoning board. Their plan of correction as of 4-19-2013 was to gain new legal counsel and required to expedite the zoning process. Application for new hearing with the City of Scranton Zoning Board was submitted and new council, of the, new council is confident that Cedar residents will be on the zoning agenda for May 2013. It was, but it was postponed. In the event that zoning is not approved, an appropriate building in Dallas, PA will be available for use on June 30th, 2013. The building will be used as a contingency plan for relocating until a permanent facility can be found. To prevent further reoccurrences, the executive director will ensure that its zoning is approved prior to moving into any facility. So they're claiming that this is a hardship on the building, but yet they've already have another building where that these people can go. Um, I have had a lot of family that have gone through rehabilitation. I do know that there is a need. I really do not think that this one is suitable for the area. Um, you have Briars and Kettle Kitchen, which um, I forget which one of them said that they go down to the corner store. If you go into there, yes, they have a little corner, they have a little area, they could buy food, but the whole, the other the whole side is nothing but beer there. If that's not temptation, I don't know. Um, my daughter, when she was in South, she does walk down before um, May, it has curbed since, the gentleman would be on the outside, they were approaching children, that's how I actually found out 
my daughter came home and told me that a couple of the gentlemen were asking the kids if they had lighters or matches. Um, and then I guess as other kids came through, she said that there were more things that they were saying. Um, another thing going back to the Department of Health, they have had many violations with um, their, administration, uh, their administrative board and their governing bodies. Um, they were not doing background checks on their people that they were hiring. Um, I don't know if you want me to read them all. I have every one. Um, I have the one for 4-10-2013. I've got the one for 2-6-2013. Um, one of the are other... Are those documents obtained on the web or on the internet? Yes, these are all can be obtained on the internet. Um, which what, was one of the... Who are they from? These are from the Pennsylvania Department of Health, the inspection results. They do uh, post them 45 days after they've done the inspections. Okay, thank you. Dan, can you take those into evidence or not? If he authenticated the... I, assu I assume the these are similar. These are all the other ones. Mm -hmm. Sure. I have also spoke to neighbors that live in the uh, area. One of the neighbors, she did not want to come and be on camera, but she said that there has been times where there were it's, noise. Yeah, but she's not here, okay. so we really don't have her testimony. No, that's all that I have then. Is there any other? And certainly since Mr. Cullen is here, he has the right to cross-examine. Mr. Collin, do you have any objection to those? No. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Collin, do you have any questions for her? No, I do not, sir. Okay. You raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Would you please state your name and address and spell your last name for us? Gail Craven, C R A V E N, 412 Maple Street. I'm a homeowner. I reside at that uh, residence. This, uh, I'm opposed to this rehab center. has greatly impacted our neighborhood, not to the good. Uh, I'm concerned about my property values. Um, I know we have the Elm Street Restoration Project in swing. I don't think that helps this project in South Scranton at all. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Is there anyone else to offer testimony? Would you raise your right hand, please? You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Could you please my state name, your name and address? My name is Rosemary Farise. My address is 903 Slocum Avenue in could South please, Scranton. Could you please um, spell your last name? F-E-R-R-I-S-E. -R -R -E. I'm here tonight to voice my concerns regarding Penswood Manor's request to convert from a personal care home to a residential drug and alcohol treatment center or halfway house. Um, Cedar Residence, uh, which is a facility, which this facility was denied zoning variance in 2011 and has been operating ever since. In 2010, a halfway house. Yeah. Um. You know, we heard a lot of testimony from his realtor saying that, um, oh, it's good for neighborhoods, but what about us, our values? You know, our values go, would go down. It's our one zone. You know, everybody else said basically what I had to say. Um, I, I just feel this isn't a good place for it. The neighbors don't like it. Um, a lot of them are afraid to come. I can't tell you what they said because you won't allow that, but um, 
you know, everybody seems to care about this place, and except, you know, the homeowners and stuff, and the families that are there. And there's like one or two businesses on that block. And it's mostly family. So where they're saying that, you know, uh, it's a business, everybody's, you know, running out of town. We've been there for years. People have been there for years. They like their neighborhood. They don't need this type of a business there, and they are afraid. Thank you. Thank and please. You. Any questions? Let's do the right thing and put an end to this once and for all. Thank you. Thank you. Next one, please. Would you raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Please state your name and address. Christina Turnbull, T-U-R-N-B-U-L-L. -L. And your address? 901 Slocum, S-L-O-C-U-M Avenue, Scranton, 18505. Good evening, my name is Christina Turnbull. I'm a 33-year resident of South Scranton. Tonight, I am speaking to you not only as a concerned neighbor, but as a mother and a proud teacher of South Scranton Intermediate School. My concerns are many with regards to this rehab facility being placed, or shall I say currently running, in a residential neighborhood. As a teacher, it concerns me that my students have to walk by this facility every day. Some students may not be aware of what this facility is. Others are, however. Were you also aware that this was a bus stop for McNichols Elementary students? Every day I drive past and amongst smiling children, there are patients sitting outside smoking cigarettes. What message are we sending to our city's impressionable children? Speaking of children, what will I tell my daughter in two years when she is at that very bus stop and stops and asks me, Mommy, who lives in that building? Speaking of who lives in that building, I feel that having such a facility in such a high foot traffic area could also be detrimental to the success of some of the clients. You may be putting the success of some of the clients at this facility at risk having such a facility in such a high foot traffic area. I would like to conclude by asking you to reconsider the placement of this facility. Southside has already been tarnished with blight and crime. I kindly ask you to reconsider this facility at 929 Cedar Avenue and to seek an alternative location. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Would you please state My your name. My name is Steve Wallace. I'm the Vice President and Commander of the Southside Neighborhood Watch. And this Could you give is us your a address? package of threat. Excuse me. Could we get your address, please? 707 South Webster Avenue, Scranton, PA. Thank you. This is a package of threat from this gentleman right here that if we spoke about this issue, he would charge us with defamation of character. Now, I find it hard to believe to have defamation of character against a business, not an individual. And we never mentioned an individual. First of all, they talked about what this facility could be. It could be anything. It's already being something. It's a residence right now. Why can't it be a residence for something else instead of what it is now? It was a residence. It's still a residence. People live in it right now. And as far as no drugs, what does he think Zoloft is? That's not a drug. It's a drug in my book, a drug in the PDR. Most of these guys sit on the Scranton Counseling Center. They get treated for psychotherapy, whatever it is they're getting treated for. They're coming back with their medication. Do we know what condition they're in? No. Do we have any insight? No. Those reports you have on the desk from the uh, health department from Scranton, uh, from Lackawanna County and the county of Pennsylvania and the state, they're all real. There's something like 120 violations in less than two years. Most facilities don't have that much, half of that in five years. And we want to put this in our residential neighborhood with our kids? I don't think so. We got enough drug problems in South Scranton. Putting these people on the street in South Scranton is like tempting them to do it again. You want the recidivism rate to go up? Keep them there. 
It'll go up because they'll walk out the door and walk into a heroin addict. They'll walk out the door and walk into an alcoholic. And that's what's going to continue in Southside. And we're trying to change what's in Southside. You mentioned before about look down Cedar Avenue, they're building new townhouses. They sure are because we're trying to bring Southside back up. It's been, you know, in the, in the bottom barrel for long enough. And I think it's time you stop it. And if you've got any questions for me, I'm here. Yes, I do have any questions for you. What's your employment background? My employment background? Yeah. Yes. I used to restore antique homes. Antique what? Antique homes. I've also been a production engineer. Good. Worked for Canon. Now, did you have any background in treatment facilities or anything? No, we have a family full of alcoholics. Well. <laughs> And I'm the only one who isn't an alcoholic, so I think I know quite a bit about it. Well, a little decorum, please. Congratulations, I appreciate that. Um, and just for your recidivism rate, my brother was clean for 18 years and fell off the wagon and was a drunk for another six. I'm sorry to hear that. Had to be incarcerated to get clean again. Well, I so I have opinions about your process and the step-down situation. If it's not stepped down long enough, it don't work. Didn't you tell WMBC, WBRE News that uh, my client was giving methadone to heroin addicts? I said, for all we know, they are. Oh, okay. So you can make those statements. I said, for all we know, they are. I heard you. I heard you, sir. So you can make statements that are defamatory as long as you condition those. I didn't name the person. Mm -hmm. And then you. Uh, can we keep the questions? We're, the We're way off the track. He brought up. He opened the door. I didn't He's open the talking door. about a prior interview we had. Yes, in the press. Yeah. That's what resulted in that package yes. being sent to you. Okay. Yes, no, but no, nothing no. I said was against the particular individual. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. You. Anything else? No, sir. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Mr. Cullen, do you have anything else to offer? I would respectfully submit to the board that as to the issue, variance by hardship, we have provided sufficient proof for the grant of this variance request. Testimony given as to safety and hardship, excuse me, safety and supposed drug trafficking and all that given earlier police reports has nothing to do with the hardship analysis and set forth in section C and D of our application. And I appreciate the comments made. This is a facility no different than any other facility that provides life, uh, life changing counseling and assistance to help people in a life-threatening disease. It's no different from that type of work which is done in any other type of medically related facility. I think some of the prejudices spoken here this evening reflects the, the, the common public feeling on this. It's not by happenstance that it took a great deal of time for this type of, of treatment to be available in this community, in the city. Uh, Mr. Lavell talked about his many years working as the, uh, with drug court with Judge Barace. When Judge Barace started that drug court, it was thought to be an, uh, uh, something that the courts should not get involved in, to help people. That program has turned out to be one of the great programs of this commonwealth. I would suggest to you that out of that process, came an understanding of the need to have these type of facilities located in metropolitan areas in order to service clients, patients, people who come out of rehab, and to denigrate them and demonize them as, as somehow threats to our society is to ignore the problem and actually seek to, to demonize them away. Everybody wants a facility like this, but nobody wants it anywhere. Uh, it's not by chance that the first facility in this county that dealt realistically with this problem was Marworth in a secluded area of Waverly Township, which just happened to be the former family residence of Governor Scranton and his family. 
I think this board is faced with whether or not we have sufficiently met the criteria for the grant of a variance based on hardship. I submit to you that we have. Our testimony supports it. I appreciate the concerns expressed by the neighbors, but I think they're largely predicated on uh, either prejudice, dislikes, or hysteria. The general upset or their general disfavor of the present state of affairs in South Scranton. None of that my client has anything to do with. I would suggest to the board respectfully that it approve my client's request for a variance, and I thank the board for its time this evening. I would like to point out two things. I would like to point out these, uh, the cooperation and the assistance given to me not only by the solicitor for this board, but also the zoning code enforcement officer. I do appreciate their efforts, and I do appreciate all the hard work this board has done. I'm sorry to see two members leaving this board, because I think this board has done great work for the city of Scranton in the last four years. And I thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? I'll entertain a motion. Okay, just uh, for clarification, um, Mr. Cullen set forth in his argument that uh, he, they've proved the hardship end of this. Uh, as you know, there's five different uh, items that have to be and, proved for and Dan, variance. I, I know you're trying to clarify, but I think we probably heard so much testimony regarding it, and I know the point you're going to bring. It, it's, it's what it does to a neighborhood. Okay, I just want to point out that and, there, are, there are the and, five criteria. that's all five the, the testimony. I, I think there are a lot of people that are very concerned. There are a lot of people that have, have family members that have problems and understand that facilities like this are needed. But from what everybody's expressed, whether it be the superintendent or anyone else, they're talking about a neighborhood. Does it affect the neighborhood? And that is one of the criteria. And everyone here will vote as they see fit. And thank you, Dan. Anyone make a motion, please? I'll make the motion. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Wallace, a motion made and seconded. Could you please take a vote? Mrs. Wardell? No. Mr. Bardnicki? No. Mr. Stangy? No. Mr. Coaches? No. By a vote of 4 to 0, your application is denied. Mr. Wallace, could you please call the next applicant? Next applicant, please step up. Good, good evening. Um, good evening. I, I'm sorry, I don't know the procedure. If, if we're ready to go. Uh, we're ready to go. Okay. Didn't know if the board needed a break or anything. My name is Joe Ferdinand. I'm here on behalf of 1021, the applicant in this, uh, in this matter. And I'd like to address the board as to why we're here briefly. Uh, we are appealing the issuance of permits to, uh, excuse me one second, 
to the purchaser of 412 Clay Avenue and the uh, owner indicated on the permits is MTJ development. Uh, we believe that the action was incorrect. We believe that there are issues that we could present to the board to show that ordinances of the city were not complied with and that there are issues that I, I think under the law and the statutes of the city should be referred to the board for decision. So uh, uh, without any further ado, I will uh, call Mr. Wallace as our first witness. I'm going to refer to some exhibits. I'm sorry, I only have one copy, but may I, Mr. Penetar, may I leave this with the board? I. I gave Mr. Wallace a copy of what I'll be referring to, and I gave the other side a copy of what I'll be referring to. That's fine. Mr. Wallace, are you going to go to the podium, or are you going to be there? Because I am going to swear you in. Um, I've got a lot of things here on this, so I'll okay. leave me here. <laughs> you can stay there. I'm swearing you in. Okay. All right. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Well, state your name and address. Michael Wallace, 511 Wall Street, Scranton. <laughs> Thank you, and I'm sure she knows how to spell that. Now, the only problem is if you stay there, that testimony is not going to be into that microphone unless we can get a microphone over to you. This is, is, is this working? Is that one? You can't hear it? I'll go over the other one. Can you hear that? Okay. Mike, if you just talk closer to the microphone. Okay, is that better? That's better. Mr. Wallace, will you please uh, state for the record your position with the city of Scranton? Uh, and Mr. Wallace, did you have occasion to uh, issue certain permits with regard to 412 Clay Avenue in the city of Scranton over the past several months? Yes, I did. All right. Now, uh, Mr. Wallace, would you agree with me that the ordinance in the city, and of course the board can take notice of its own ordinance, but the ordinance in the city and and in, in virtually every community in the state would indicate that you as the zoning officer uh, can, can issue permits when there is a permitted, what we call permitted by right use, and there's no, essentially no question on the use. Is that a fair statement? Yes, it is. And uh, let's then first deal with uh, something called your condemned property ordinance in the city of Scranton. And again, I would ask the board to take notice of its own, of the ordinances in the city, but I have a section of your city ordinance in the packet that I, uh, that I left with the board. Now, in section 359.2 that I've given you a copy of, there is a certain work or certain information required of an applicant uh, who, who has purchased or who owns a condemned property. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. Now, would you agree with me that 412 Clay Avenue, uh, as of as late as last August, was condemned by the city of Scranton? Yes, it was. I'm going to show you something else or, or ask you to refer to something else in the packet just behind the, uh, the statute I was just referring to, the condemned property portion of your ordinance. It's a picture of a, what I think is a, a condemned notice. Would you go just behind, it's about page four. Yes, I see it. Okay. And does that, you agree with me, indicate it was originally issued uh, and it, uh, at, for 412 Clay Avenue, and it was originally issued on February 28, 2008? Yes. And then it was reposted, I believe it says on top, on August 8, 
2012? That's correct. And that, as I said, is, is dealing with 412 Clay Avenue? Yes. Okay. Now, when <clears throat> representatives of uh, MTJ Development, the landowner in this case, came to you for the building permit, uh, and I guess there was an electrical permit and a mechanical permit issued. Um, did you uh, obtain from them the affidavit and other information referred to in uh, the condemned property ordinance of the city? No. Okay. Uh, do you know today, for instance, whether MTJ has uh, uh, open taxis on 412 Clay Avenue? No, I don't. If I were to show you or ask you to refer to in the packet, uh, just be behind the condemned uh, sticker or placard, uh, print out from Northeast Revenue uh, entitled City of Scranton Tax Claim Bureau listing delinquent taxes on 412 Clay Avenue from 2003 to 2011. And by the way, this indicates municipal. Um, would you have any reason to dispute that? No, I wouldn't. Now, does the condemned property policy indicate that the affidavit and these tax certificate and things of that nature are necessary before any work can be performed on a condemned property? Do you see the, uh, that in the first paragraph? Right. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> I then obtained a copy of the building permit, uh, and that is further in the packet. Uh, it's uh, building permit number B as in boy 130-30167 and it indicates it was uh, issued on March 26, 2013. Do you agree? Do you see that in the packet? Yes, I do. And uh, the application attached to this building permit, uh, which is the next page, uh, in answer to a question on the form itself as to whether the property is condemned, the, the applicant checks yes. Is that correct? That's correct. And the applicant indicates in paragraph 8 that uh, existing use of the, prop of the property is uh, apartments, three apartments, and the planned or proposed use is for three apartments. Is that correct? That is correct. Now, two pages further on, there are uh, blanks for what's called official use only, and uh, there is an approved check mark by yes, and uh, initials which look to me to be MW, signature of zoning officer. That's correct. And was that, can you take a look at that? Are they your uh, initials? Yes, they are. And that was not dated, but was it in the uh, uh, vicinity of March 26, 2013 when the other Building code official signed it? Yes, it was. I stamped those and it more than likely doesn't come off in the copier. All right. And uh, Mr. Wallace, continuing on, and there's several pages with that uh, building uh, permit and application, but behind it is an electrical permit. And similar to the questions, I'll save time, similar to the questions asked about the building permit, <coughs> uh, there is a, uh, a very similar application. And again, you are asked, or the zoning officer is asked to approve or disapprove. And would you look to the rear of that? And again, initials MW with a check mark for approve. Correct. Is that correct? Okay. And then there's a mechanical permit, but I don't believe, uh, I, I did not see, uh, you know, any particular approval on your part. Now, 
Uh, Mr. Mr. Wallace, with regard to this property, have you personally or do you know from other, per, perhaps other members of the zoning office, whether there have been inspections on this property over the past several years? Yes, there have. All right, and um, I see we discussed already that it was originally condemned back in 2008 and then reposted. Uh, now, would you know, or to your knowledge, has there been any use of the property uh, over the uh, since it was posted, reposted in August of 2012 no. to, to date? No. No. And do you know then in 2012 whether there was any use uh, on this property? I don't believe so. Okay. So would you would you agree with me that there is an issue under uh, the uh, abandonment section of your ordinance well or discontinuance of the use section of your ordinance um, in the handout that I gave you would you please go to exhibit 2c to be sorry okay, if that's okay okay yes that's the city condemned property policy right the, ne the next page is a, is a uh, certificate of nonconformity drafted by the city legal department mm -hmm. uh, approving the use of 412 clay avenue But uh, did you sign that then? Yes, I did. And did you uh, sign that despite uh, the knowledge that we just elicited from you with regard to the non-use of the property over perhaps the last 12 months at least? I signed this before all the other permits were signed. Sorry? This was signed before all of the other permits were. Okay. Uh, but but the, the point being, from your file and from your personal experience, um, you, it's your testimony tonight that, that there has not been the apartment or residential use of 412 Correct. for the past year or so. Right. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, in your file, Mr. Wallace, uh, and I'm talking about the zoning office file on 412, if, okay. if there is one. Is there a rental registration uh, ever filed for 412? I don't believe so. All right. <clears throat> Was it in your package? Because I didn't notice that today. Sorry, I... <clears throat> Was there one in the package that you got from the law department? Not, not what I have received or reviewed. Okay, then there, then there is none. <clears throat> Would you have any, uh, and I've been asking you generally about 412, but I understand that there's a front unit and a rear unit. Would, Correct. Would you have any different answer to any of my questions if I specified the rear unit? No. Okay. So, so essentially it'd be the same? Yes. Okay. Uh, I have nothing further uh, of this witness. Do you have any other witnesses? Uh, I, I have some okay, hold. questions. Does the other I'm side want to cross it? Well, some members of the board have some questions, so we'll take care of us first. Mr. Wallace, what was the official date uh, of your decision on the matters surrounding these applications? You mean what date were the applications signed? What was the, your 
uh, the, uh, the oh the certificate of nonconformity from the law department was signed on March first. Okay, and Attorney Ferdinand, your uh, clients uh, made application to, uh, or uh, filed their appeal on. I'm assuming the 22nd of April, but I'm hoping you can give me a hard date on that. That's the date I have. The 22nd, did you say, Mr. Sting? Yes. Yes, and uh, yeah, we were, the, the information we had at the time, by, by the way, I didn't see that uh, certificate you re referenced until tonight. Uh, and I did request all documents on, these, on this property from the city and a right to know request. Uh, that I received on the 31st or second day after the request. So I, I made the request late April and received the documents late May. I but just we appealed. I think where you're going is we appealed within 30 days of all those other permits. Well, that's. I just want to uh, be clear on that. On both uh, 111F of the uh, 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 the zoning uh, ordinance and the 914.1 of the MPC uh, where they talk about the timeliness of appeals. I just want to make sure that we do in fact have jurisdiction on this considering it uh, some of the documents are dated on the 1st of, 1st of March and it appears as though uh, this was not filed uh, until at least uh, the 22nd of April. Problem with that is you can file documents any date you want but until someone starts work you don't know work is being done. So we had determined in previous ones that the timeline we're going to use is from the what is a reasonable point of seeing work being done before you would question it. You can get a permit from Mr. Walls today and not start work for six months. Does that conclude my opportunity to challenge your, your work or his well, issue? I, I'm, just, I'm just I, looking we, at the plan we had gone over. the law. Yeah, I had looked at that, but we had gone over that before. It, it is something that's got to be reasonable. Uh, but while you're on that question, dealing with Mr. Wallace, um, I'm just curious why this didn't have to come before the zoning board. I, who made that decision? The law department. The, the law department. The law department. Now, just so I understand that, you're talking about Mr. Kelly, correct? Yes. Okay. Mr. Kelly sent to the bankruptcy judge a copy of all of the things that were required, specifically noting all of the properties that were turned over. Unfortunately, he filed his application two days too late. So there was no challenge to it in the uh, bankruptcy proceedings. And uh, when he did file that, he filed the copy of, what do we have? Mr. Wallace, this information is in the rear of the packet I gave you, if you wanted to refer to it. Yeah, we, we had gotten all of it. The condemnation policies were included, and uh, okay. Mr. Kelly specifically informing the judge in that case that all of those items had to be followed and I'm just wondering why all of a sudden Mr. Kelly had a change of heart that he would file that with the judge and then turn around and decide that we didn't need any of these things uh, and, and then you stamp that particular item so could you just shed some light as to why all of a sudden it all changed? Mr. Coaches, you would have to speak with Attorney Kelly. I wish he was here that I could speak with them, to be very honest. I, I reviewed this, and, and I was just stunned because there are things that he documents as being condemned on, let's see, what was his date? He filed his October 12th, 2012, but yet when things rolled around in March and April, all of a sudden, buildings that were condemned were no longer condemned. I, and I, I don't know why he would have told the judge that the property was condemned and then come back six, seven months later and says, oh, it's not condemned. I, I don't know if he was misinformed. I'm also stunned that 
we let, or the city, I, you know, we're, we're fighting for our lives here. I, I'm stunned that Mr. Kelly did not file. I, it was very simple. The judge gave him 14 days for anybody, any creditors, to file any objections. And then to file that two days late. And then you wonder why taxes aren't paid. There was, the city was obviously a large creditor for 10 properties. Let's just get back to the one we're dealing with. Why do other people have to come here for variances and this one didn't? I, I, it's, now, you're the one who signed the document. Correct. So what was your reasoning for it? I was told to. You were told to. That's right. I take orders. Okay. As you are under testimony, who told you to? I uh, was in the law office signing these. Who was? Uh, honestly, I'm not sure. I don't believe it was Attorney Kelly. I believe it was one of the secretaries. One of the secretaries. Was it a lawyer or one of your superiors? Uh, the, uh, I believe it was uh, Kara Seitzinger. Who told you? Kara Seitzinger. Karen Seitzinger? Yes, Kara. K-A-R-A. Okay. So we're, we're talking about She's Mark Seitzinger's wife? Right, the paralegal in the department. Oh. Okay. And you were told to sign that document? Yes. If you were not told to sign that document, would you have signed the document? Mm, I'm glad I didn't Or have would you have told them they need to come before this board? Uh, I believe so. You believe you would have told them they had to come before this board or you would have signed it? Uh, I more than likely would have told them. I, I'm I would have told them, come to the board. Okay. Uh, it answers a lot of questions. Uh, you know, some people think I get out of line, and I do, I know that. I, I want to make comments before, but it, it astonishes me that, good Lord, we're bankrupt, <laughs> and we just let dollars flow every place. <clears throat> God almighty. I, I'm sorry. Uh, anybody else have any other questions? Because that certainly sets my day. Anybody else have any questions? Mr. Wallace? Yes. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Ready. Mr. Ferdinand, continue. I have, I have no redirect. Okay. Do you have any other witnesses? Uh, I have no other witnesses, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I offer the exhibits uh, that I have placed before you uh, to be part of the record of this case. Okay. I don't know how far they have, but <sighs> evidently, Mr. Terry only had a number of problems with a number of properties. The specific one you were talking about was condemned uh, back in 2008. It was never released according to the documents that are from the uh, uh, condemned book. There, there is one in the city, although you can't find it on a website. And uh, when properties are condemned, if they're released, they're marked released, if they're destroy their their red line because they no longer exist but that property was condemned in 2008 uh, by Graziano and I think Fowler unfit for human habitation it, it had a couple of things it, it had been condemned or brought a number of times uh, according to our rules according to what we have we have someone going in and using an apartment, and I, I, I dread to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway, because it astonishes me that we can have a rule, and, and only because I know, and Dan knows, I asked him a few weeks ago about what constitutes the number of people you can have in an apartment, and included in your documents, although I don't know where I put them, We have people that approved when you're only allowed four, 13 people in the unit, nine people in the unit, eight people in the unit. Every one of these violates the rules. Every one of them. And no one, no one did anything. But, and your name's on those documents. You signed off on documents. And you know, right? All the other properties they have? Yes. Okay. 
You did sign those documents, correct? Yes. Okay. And I'm going to ask you again, since you're still under testimony, were you told to sign those documents? Yes. I'm going to read the, the only one that has 412 is a nice, very clear piece. It has units one, two, three, and four, four occupants each. They duplicated it. And then we'll go to another property, 421, and these aren't in, in this, but just to show what happens, 421 clay, maximum 10 occupants. 421 rear clay, maximum eight occupants. 421, okay, eight and 10 again, we duplicate things. First floor, 425, max six. Second floor, <coughs> max five. Four twenty four max second floor eight. And we beat up on other people that come in here and we won't grant them a variance because they don't have three parking spots or four parking spots. But yet and, and only because I know it, my wife had asked this. Someone had been issued a certificate or a citation in another place and there were five people in a place and they were told you can only have four. But yet, we sign documents that say you can have eight. It astonishes me. This is my seventh year on this board. This absolutely tops all of them. Does anybody else have anything to ask Mr. Ferdinand before we well, get testimony on the other side? Certainly. Or perhaps if you could pass off that microphone. Sure. Uh, it's not going to reach. Okay. It's no. not going to reach. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Bill Dunstone. I'm an attorney uh, at Oliver Price and Rhodes in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania and I'm representing MTJ Development LLC in this matter. And considering that we're, Mr. Ferdinand has finished testimony for his client, I, I would limit my questioning to Mr. Ferdinand at this point, and then I would like to question Mr. Wallace a bit, and maybe I can uh, answer some of your questions, Mr. Coaches. I understand you have many questions. So, um, Mr. Ferdinand, just a few questions. Uh, the application that you filed was on behalf of 1021 Mulberry LLC. Is that your client? Is that your sole client in this matter? Uh, I understand. But let, me, let me put this up. I have an agreement with 1021. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, I, I have a, the client is 1021. 1021 indicates, and I put on the appeal others, 1021 indicated there were men, other landowners, uh, and you will see on my appeal. Uh, but I do not, what I'm trying to say is I do not deal with them directly. I deal with them through 1021. Uh, I, I listed uh, affected property owners. There are probably 10 on my, on my appeal. But, but my, my actual client is 1021. So, so the applicant in this matter is 1021 uh, Mulberry LLC and no other applicants. Well, I think I filed on behalf of the others, but what I'm trying to say is I did not deal with them. Okay. Attorney Frederick, just to be clear then for the record, why don't you just state who the applicants are for us so we know who we're talking about. May I just check with 1021 because these I, I'm I'm want to recite all the names that I was given, but I want to be certain that I'm being correct. For Absolutely. The
my apology for the delay. Uh, <clears throat> I understand that I may recite all of those listed on the on the application, and I, in response to your question, I will. 405 <clears throat> Clay LLC, Red House Realty Inc., Christopher M. Phillips, Alphonse Matrone, AJA Scranton LLC, David Phillips, Kathleen Kahanowitz, Dr. Yitzhak Kurtzer, Palazzetto LLC, Patricia Suhaki, uh, Jacob Herber, Kenneth Sandrowich, C Mark, that's spelled C M A R Q LLC, JMJ Property Company LLC, 480, I'm sorry, 408 Quincy Inc. Can you tell me what properties your clients own relative and where they are located relative to the 412 Clay Avenue property? I cannot. I can only tell you that uh, 1012, 1012 is 21 rather, 1021 Mulberry LLC is located directly across the street or almost directly across the street on uh, Clay. If I, if I showed you a map, would you be able to point that out to me? I can't, but I would call a representative of, I think I can, but I, I will verify with a representative LLC. Yes, do you want to show me where 412 Clay is? 412 Clay is there. Now, um, is this oriented Mulberry north or south? Mulberry Street. Mulberry. Okay, I came up Mulberry. Um, it is it one of. It would be easier if I pass out some of these maps. Yeah. Do you want to? Uh, no. No. And I circled it so that I could see it a little better. Uh, 1021 Mulberry LLC, to the best of my knowledge, as I met today to review the properties, is directly across Clay, but somewhat cat corner. And I believe it is a uh, property num that has the number 15 members of the board. Would be to the left of the 412 and one down. That's the best of my, my understanding. And, the, and the, the, old, the worst I would be off would be one property would be the next. Uh, but that's my understanding, it's one in. Have you been to the property? I was today, yes. And in the past. If I informed you that in the <coughs> assessment record, uh, this is the assessment map from the County of Lackawanna and I did research and I found that 1021 LLC actually owns tax map number 15729-020037, which would be the property at Costello Court and Mulberry Street, which would be the property which has 13 to 14 written on it. Would that be the property that you're referencing or is it still the property with the number 15 on it? That's not my understanding. To answer your question, what you stated is not my understanding. You may be correct, but today I, un I looked at a building uh, that was where I, I am indicating, uh, fifth, uh, lot number 15. Do you have a deed or anything else to show the 1021 Mulberry owns a particular property? I do not. Do you have a deed or any other documents to show that any of your other clients own any particular property? I do not. Uh, do your clients own multi-unit dwellings or single-family residences or parking lots or what do they own? Uh, my client, I understand, and I don't, I own, this is what client tells me, owns uh, other rental units in the city of Scranton, if I'm answering your question. Okay, so they are rental landlords? Yes. All of them? Don't know that. I, I honestly don't know that. Many of them? 
I understand that more than one are, yes. All right, and many of your, your clients have addresses that aren't in Lackawanna County and some of which are even out of state, is that correct? I just noticed that. I, it's my, I would assume that they are the owners of properties in that neighborhood. Okay, and the, the appeal that you had filed uh, listed a number of properties owned by MTJ. <laughs> Is that correct? Yes, I wanted to present all, but was in, um, advised by Mr. Wallace by telephone uh, uh, that I would need to request individual hearings on other properties, even though it's the same issue, basically, uh, on other properties. So uh, that was something I wanted to bring to the board uh, before we left today today because I as I say it happened in a telephone call and uh, I, I think by way of clarification I think the other properties carried separate tax map numbers that and would therefore be, would be sure separate would be. properties yeah and Dan can I interrupt you had he listed all of those properties and separate tax numbers on one filing would that have been acceptable no because they're separate appeals each one is a separate appeal each one's a separate appeal okay May I, may I just respond, Mr. Penatar? My understanding, and, and I would, if we have to argue this legally, I would be happy to uh, submit the appropriate authority, but all we're asking is that the appeal be accepted as of the date filed. We were then instructed you know, to request separate hearings, and we only want two or more hearings, but, but that is stamped in as of April 22nd. And I'm seeing it as a writ or something that may have been filed in the wrong county or something, but the key thing is the date. So uh, we filed that, and then, as I say, sometime later, heard from Mr. Wallace. So uh, members of the board, that's something we may have to deal with at a later date. How many appeal filings did you pay? Paid one. Paid one, and did the city respond to you that if you wanted to file sorry i can't hear you sorry. did anyone we're going to either have to put you with two different microphones or whatever since you're going to banter back and forth it'd be much easier please <coughs> did anyone at the city ever ask you to submit multiple filing fees for the multiple appeals yes mr wallace and did you ever submit those additional checks not to date but that was probably uh 10 days ago so, was it, so you, you've had at least 10 days to submit that's that correct. and you chose not to. That's correct. It's something I wanted to bring up to the board this evening. Okay. So as of right now, as we speak in the middle of this hearing, one appeal fee has been paid and this appeal is really about 412 Clay Avenue. Well, that's the way I was instructed by Mr. Wallace, that they, he would advertise 412 for this evening's meeting. Okay. Your clients have multiple unit properties, and is their motive in filing this application financial? How are they affected by this, by the granting of these permits? I, I think the answer, the, the way they've expressed it to me is they simply wanted a level playing field that everybody would abide by the same rules, this, the ordinances of the town. Is there any particular harm to any particular property? Well, I, th I think they all are landlords in that area and uh, bought or invested in properties based on the ordinances of the town. And uh, so I think they, as I say, they just want everyone to have to follow the same rules. Uh, in one of the prior proceedings, I know you were out in the hallway during the uh, proceedings involving the grocery store and the <coughs> University of Scranton application for variance. Attorney Penetar referred to the zoning ordinance with the provisions regarding non-conforming uses. Are you familiar with that section of the zoning ordinance? I am. And did you notice the section that said that uh, a property owner can make an application to the zoning officer for a statement concerning non-conforming uses? Uh, yes. 
And does that section of the ordinance give the zoning officer the discretion to issue a certificate of nonconformity? Uh, if you would cite the section, I'll take a look at it. I believe I'm... Uh, 806B? Yeah, the, the form that I was given uh, said 36-136. That's what Mr. Seitzinger had given to me. Uh, I don't know if there's an updated ordinance on it, but that was given to me by Mr. Seitzinger about a year ago, two years ago. And it, it, it's, it stated, uh, B, registration and continuing continuation of nonconformities. Uh, that section says, it shall be the responsibility of a party asserting a nonconformity to provide the evidence that it is lawful a property owner may request a written statement of nonconformity from the zoning officer after providing su sufficient evidence. The zoning officer may, but is not required to, prepare a partial or complete list of existing nonconformities. Yes, I see that. Uh, do you think that's the basis for the certificate of nonconformity that was issued by Mr. Wallace, Mr. Seitzinger, and Mr. Kelly on March 1st? I can't answer for them. Okay. I have no further questions. Thank you. All right. Before you leave, I do believe Mr. Wallace testified under oath that he was told he had to sign that. I, I understand what you're saying. The zoning officer has the right for that nonconformity. Under oath, Mr. Wallace said that decision was not his. So that eliminates someone else made that decision, not the zoning officer. It doesn't say the law clerk. It doesn't say the solicitor of the city. It doesn't say the director of LIPS. It says the zoning officer. And under testimony, he's already offered that he would not have done that. I understand that. I, I'm well, I, I, yeah, but the point you're trying to bring is he had the right to say to do that. And I understand that. I'm just bringing out the point that he's telling you he did not have the right. He was compelled to. And there's a difference. I. I do, I do have other questions for Mr. Wallace, and I understand your concerns, Mr. Coaches. Okay. Uh, and at this point, I, I was on cross-examination of Attorney Ferdinand. I'm probably wearing three different hats as I stand here at this microphone. Uh, and I can't say that I was involved personally in the issuance of the Certificate of Nonconformity. I know that I was involved in another property at 448 Monroe Avenue, and the Certificate of Nonconformity was the way that the zoning issues were addressed and it was another one of the Turner and Oney properties it was in 2011 and that's how it got addressed right and a, a lot of that was done before they came up with this condemnation policy which the reasoning for it is we do have a lot of condemned buildings we're trying to create that playing field but it's there it states what you need to do why can some people bypass it and others have to follow it? Uh, it it's a simple process. Right. We, we don't have to beat each other up. We just have to all play by the same rules. And, and from my perspective as the representative of MTJ Development, I believe MTJ Development came to the city in good faith as a good businessman. And it's not like we went and started building on the garage and there was a stop work order. We acquired the title to the properties in a deed in lieu of, of uh, foreclosure. And we immediately went to the city. We approached Mr. Seitzinger, Mr. Mr. Kelly, and Mr. Wallace, and other officials of the government. We said we we have we own these properties. We want to make them productive properties, and we want to put them back on the tax rolls. And we went. We obtained our certificate of nonconformity to solve what we thought were the zoning issues. That we went in good faith, and that's how that was the prior procedure. And, and, and I then, would believe that, except for the fact that some of the individuals involved. In that group, it's not the first time they've purchased the property or rehabilitated or have been involved with the city. They, they, they've been before. There are individuals involved. They've been before this board before. And that, uh, Under I, TKO. I believe TKO is a different entity. Okay. TKO did own that property and passed it on to someone else. Is that what the case is? No, I, I believe uh, I believe TKO has different principles than than uh, MTJ does, 
And uh, my client, the principals of MTJ are various businessmen, and they're in the audience tonight. You have Michael Kelly, who's, who's a nursing home operator who's been in business for 25 years with various nursing home projects, restaurant projects, and other projects. And then you have his son, Thomas, and, and uh, Jonathan Olivetti as well. And there are different principals in the different entities. Okay. Believe me, this, this board would love to see all of these properties rehabilitated. But let's do it the right way. And it, it just... That's what we're trying to 13, do. 13 people in one building to me is a rooming house, not a unit. Okay? And Eight people in one unit is a rooming house. It's not an apartment. And I believe what we were doing was uh, tacking on to what Mr. Terranoni had done as the prior owner of the properties. And that's how the 448 Monroe property got rehabilitated as well and is now a productive tax-paying property owned by Gary Hughes, Jr. And how many units are in it? Uh, hold on. That property on the first floor has six units, six occupants. On the second floor has six units, and on the third floor has four. So it is 16. Okay, so you have 16. It's supposed to be four. That, that's a different property. And it's a different the property. Purpose of, I, I understand. Uh, uh, why, why do we have the zoning? What do we have this book for? Okay, I, and, and I don't know the history of any of this, I, I, but I'm going to set forth what it may be. It may be that these that there were 10 people in a certain unit prior to the adoption of the 1993 ordinance, and it just got grandfathered in. I, again, I'm I'm but speculating. We, we don't, I don't, we know, don't that. know that. I don't but, know that at all. I'm, but I'm just Dan, speculating. Once they got condemned, that now, all now went off a, the boards. You're right. You're that right. That all went off the boards. You're, you are so correct. So any property that's condemned, after none the, of that counts. After the six months, right? <laughs> I believe we might have conflicting laws on the nonconformity versus the condemnation. Might be different, different applicable, applicability of the relevant laws for the zoning. Maybe the zoning ordinance conflicts with the condemnation ordinance. I guess that'll be decided someplace other than here, won't it? Uh, but I believe we're here tonight. Right, we're here tonight and we're dealing with this one particular property, 412. Yes. Okay. I have no further questions for Mr. Ferdinand. Uh, I don't know if you want me to ask questions to Mr. Wallace. If you have questions, ask them. Feel free. Okay. Mr. Wallace, did you ever issue a certificate of nonconformity previous to March 1st on, on the MTJ property? That would have been to Mr. Terranoni, and I don't remember doing it. No. I, I just want to clear up. We're talking, we're talking about 412? 412. Okay. No, I, I, w I was just asking on oh. generally, has he ever issued a certificate of nonconformity? On yes. Okay. Right, on other properties, yes. And was it done pursuant to this, uh, the statute that Mr. Seitzinger gave to me two years ago when I was representing Gary Hughes, Jr.? Are you talking about Section 8 in the zoning ordinance? Uh, he handed me this uh, document, Section 36-136, nonconformities, and pointed out nonconforming uh, uses that the zoning officer uh, could provide a written statement of nonconformity upon sufficient evidence, such as prior leases of the premises or the inspection reports that the city had generated from prior inspections. No, I've used the city ordinance, the city zoning ordinance, so we okay. have a form in the office for it. Okay, and is the sitting, city zoning ordinance as as I said, is there a section that says that you as the zoning officer would have the discretion to issue a certificate of nonconformity? Yes. And is that how you were proceeding in this matter? Excuse me, when you say am I proceeding in this matter, I, I'm not sure what, I, what you mean by that. What was the certificate, the certificate of nonconformity that was issued that is in uh, Attorney Ferdinand's packet? Correct. That was issued. You signed it, correct? Yes. And Mr. Kelly signed it? Yes. And Mr. Seitzinger signed yes. it? Yes. And was that done after a full inspection of the properties by the city? Yes. And so in October of 2012, MTJ became the deed owner of the property and they contacted the city. And they asked 
your office as well as Mr. Seitzinger, Mr. Kelly, how to proceed to get zoning approval for the number of occupants of the premises. Okay. For, for each property, is that correct? Is that your? I don't know. I, I wasn't involved in that. Okay. Did you have any involvement prior to March first, twenty twelve? I was at the inspection on January twenty, late January. I'm not sure. So there was a, there was an inspection of the yes. of the property, and was that done after a meeting with Mr. Seitzinger and maybe uh, Michael Kelly or Thomas Kelly or Jonathan Olivetti or no, someone else on behalf in, of MTJ? I wasn't involved in any meetings with them prior to that. Okay, and so what, what did the inspection reveal? Uh, condemned properties needed a lot of work in all different ways, and I told them they would need zoning board approval to use these buildings for anything other than a single family. And was that the same procedure that was done for Gary Hughes in 2011 for I, 448 Monroe? Uh, I, I don't I, remember. Mr. I'd have to look all that up. I don't remember. Okay, then how did this certificate get signed by you on March 1st? It was put in front of me and told to sign it. And who told you to sign it? In the law office. I believe this uh, <coughs> paralegal. And is that after they reviewed the inspection reports and reviewed the, the prior documents regarding the occupancy of the property? When you say they, who do you mean by they? Uh, the law department. Uh, I didn't ask. You didn't ask, you just signed the certificate just of nonconformity? Yes. Have you taken any actions to revoke the certificate of nonconformity since March 1st? I revoked the building permits. I put a stop work order on the property. Okay, and is that the point where you asked for a posting of a, a bond and a $50,000 check was posted? No, I didn't ask for that. I put the stop work order up and I sent a letter to uh, the owners. I believe it's uh, section 2C, I'm looking for it. It's in section 2C. I mailed it on April 26th. And were the stop work orders rescinded? Yes. So the city gave approval for MTJ to continue work on the, yes. on the buildings? So as of right now, except for the appeal filed by Attorney Ferdinand and 1021 Mulberry LLC, uh, there are a certificate of nonconformity still existing from March 1st, 2013, building permits from March and April, and the stop work order has been, not, has been rescinded so that they can continue working on the buildings. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. One of the questions that Attorney Ferdinand asked related to an affidavit regarding condemned properties. Is that correct? Do you recall that? M. David? Affidavit. Oh, affidavit. An affidavit. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, do you recall his questions regarding that, regarding the condemnation uh, ordinance? Did uh, you? I believe he sure. testified that no affidavit was ever provided by MTJ. The, to my understanding, but when that tax information goes to the city tax collector's office, they check off on that and then it comes back okay. to us. What office are you in? Zoning. Licensing okay. inspections and permits, but zoning. Okay. Do you know if Mark Seitzinger ever received a, 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 such an affidavit from Jonathan Olivetti? I don't know. Okay. showing you a document which is dated April 29th, 2013 from the Olivetti Law Firm, LLC. It's addressed to Mark Seitzinger, Director of Licensing Inspections and Permits, and it relates to MTJ development regarding affidavit regarding condemned properties 412, 424, 421, 
Clay Ave, 420 Quincy Ave, 421 Costello Court. Do you recognize that? Yes. And attached to that is a one-page form which seems to indicate the city of Scranton condemned property policy, does it not, on the last page? Yes. And would this document be an affidavit concerning the condemned property status of this 412 Clay Avenue property? Yes. And in that affidavit, does it say that there was a tax certificate that was attached, and unfortunately my copy doesn't have the attachment, but it also says that the owner hereby certifies that it has presented itself to the city treasurer to make arrangements for the payment of in full of taxes and waste? That's number seven, I believe. Yes. Uh, would you know if there was money held in escrow by the, the uh, escrow company from the real estate closing for the payment of well, all the city taxes? It says there is. Okay, and do you know if Mr. Seitzinger would have checked with uh, the Treasury Department or someone else about the tax status before, before any action on any of these permits? Yes. Yes, you know, or yes, he would have? Yes, he would. So Mr. Seitzinger may have may have checked on some of these issues related to the certificate of nonconformity? Yes. Okay. And what is your title? Excuse me? What is your title? Zoning officer. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm just trying to see why, why there would be three signatures required instead of just one if the ordinance only says zoning officer. So uh, was it kind of a tag team approach as to different parts of this project? Uh, again, that's a question for the law department. Okay, did you do part of the work on, on these permits and then Mr. Seitzinger would have done part of the work and Mr. Kelly would have done other parts of the were work? Are you talking about the building permits? Any of the permits, any of the well, permits the building that were permits, issued. The building permits, we look at them and I cite them from a zoning standpoint. Uh, Mark Seitzinger and the building inspectors do them from the building standpoint. So there is collaboration between your office and Mr. Seitzinger's office? Yes. Okay. And is the law department at all involved at all in any of the zoning matters? Uh, when I bring it to them, mostly. So if, there's, if the law department looked at the zoning issues and said that there was compliance and you should issue the certificate, would you rely on their advice? Yes. And is that what happened? Doesn't care with Seitzinger work in the law department? Excuse me? Doesn't Kara Seitzinger work in the law department? Yes. She's one of the paralegals there, isn't she? Yes. So if Kara Seitzinger called you up and said, sign the form, I reviewed it, or Paul Kelly reviewed it, then you would rely on the law department and you would sign the form. Yes. Is that correct? And you admit that you were involved in the decision-making part of processing these applications, doing the inspection, checking on the taxes and everything else. Yes. Is that correct? Okay, correct. so it wasn't that somebody just called you from on high on the telephone and said, sign the stupid thing. You were involved in this process for months. Yes. Correct? Yes. I have nothing further. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Oh, sorry. No, go I just wanted to. <clears throat> um, so that would be an example of selective enforcement. Then you signed this because someone told you to. Excuse me. Selective enforcement, like he when he was uh, so uh, like Koshis was saying before. How why do we have this book if some people have to follow the rules, other people don't? Uh, I'm not would sure that, that's the way it should be phrased. I, I think I think when I you read when you read the, when you read the uh, the ordinance, it says the property owner may request a written statement of nonconformity from the zoning officer after providing sufficient evidence. Well, now, providing sufficient evidence is something that goes to Mr. Wallace, and if he has a question, he then brings in the law department to, to review whether they think it's sufficient evidence or not. We can't get involved, the zoning board nor myself can get involved in that because ultimately it comes back to us. Um, so, so but Dan, I'm put my a, a decision must have been made that there was sufficient evidence. At least that's what we have to assume. Dan, under the duties and powers of the zoning office, 110B number seven, zoning officers shall not have the power to permit any activity which does not conform to this ordinance or all other ordinance of the city known to the zoning officer. 
doesn't say he has the power to do anything. It says he does not have the power. Mm -hmm. well, I, I was on page was page one eight. I, I was addressing the certificate of not conformity. Okay. Well, the I'm just addressing different, different section. I'm just addressing what the simple man looks at, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mr. Wallace, I just am looking for some clarity on the uh, placement of the stop work order and then uh, the uh, motivation, I guess, for it to be rescinded. What what was the catalyst for the stop work order to be placed, and then under what conditions was it rescinded? Putting the that was the last day, I believe, that we could put that on the buildings. It was within the 30-day window. MTJ Development could uh, turn their permits into the city and say there may have been a mistake with them being issued, and then it would be their responsibility to come to the zoning board. Do we have any other testimony? I, I just have a f two questions of Mr. Wallace, maybe three. Uh, Mr. Wallace, this um, uh, affidavit you've been shown, um, would you agree with me that it's dated April 29, 2013? Yes. And that nonconformity, certificate of nonconformity that we've been talking about, that was issued back in March 1 of 2013? Yes. And also, would you agree with me that our appeal was logged in on, I believe it was April 22nd of yes. 2013? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and I, I just didn't hear your answer to, is it Stang, sir? Stang. Stang. His question. Uh, do, do you remember how you answered uh, the question? I didn't hear the answer. That was about... Why did I put this? Why did I rescind the stop work orders? Yes. Why did I put them on? Yes. The stop work orders were put on the building the last, the, th the 30th day of them being issued. It gave the owners of the property the opportunity to evaluate their position and possibly do something positive for uh, turn in the permits, possibly, and come to the zoning board themselves if they felt there was any issues with it. But that wasn't the case. Okay. All right. I have nothing further. Any other testimony, please? Were the stop work orders issued related to the performance bond for the work to be performed? No, the stop work orders were issued. Let me look at something here. It says, please be advised that a stop work order is being posted on each of these properties today. And I have the listing of the addresses. All workers to stop on the above properties pending a full examination of the permits by the city's zoning licensing inspections and permits office and the city solicitor. Please, and then it says, stop work on this until we get back to them. And that was the letter that came to them from and the law office, the certificate of nonconformance on the building. And when were the stop work orders lifted? Excuse me? When were the stop work orders lifted? That was Too earlier than that. That was, a, I believe, that was a Friday. I'm just saying, this is your memo. This is the memo from Paul Kelly to you saying it says that you should lift the stop. They were issued on a Friday. They were issued on a Thursday or a Friday, and they were lifted the following Monday. Following? Did you say Monday? Monday. And was that after the performance bond was posted? The fifty thousand dollar performance bond. <clears throat> yes. 
Yeah, that was posted on the 26th. That was the requirement to lift the, the stop work order, wasn't it? Well, it, my requirement was approval from the law office on the entire thing, the whole project. Did you communicate that to anybody in writing? Excuse me? Did you communicate that to anyone in writing? That there was a stop work order? I sent a letter to the, uh, to the developers. Okay, I hear you're saying that you were going to tell every, you were going to tell MTJ to go and come to well, the zoning no, no. board. And and we had a, yes, there was a meet when they were signing the check. I was talking to them, but and they, they signed the check and they posted the the bond. performance bond and the stop and work three order. Three days was later, I got the letter out of the law office, which you relied upon. Yes, the law office. Yes. So you relied upon the law office to make a decision of whether the, the law was being followed? Yes. Did you expect MTJ development to rely on these permits? To rely on the permits? Right, and, and proceed with their development? Well, it's, they're their permit. They have to rely on the permits. Well, do you understand how many weeks of work they've already done and how much money they've put into all these properties? That's, uh, this is a serious matter. There's a million dollars worth of improvements in these properties. I understand that. And, and you're sitting here and you're telling the board, well, I told them to go to the board and I, I well, issued these permits. Like, what was it? They went to, obviously, the law office saw it different and they okayed, the, they issued orders to okay the permits, to approve the and, permits. And, and the permits okay? are approved. And, and I didn't come here tonight. To, to do this. So you weren't going to countermand the, the law department on those issues? Do no, you agree the with the law de department as we sit here today or don't you? My law, my, I take the law department's word on issues like this. Okay, so the law department was the final word on whether the certificates of nonconformity should be issued, the building permits, the Whether they are order. legal and they fit the zoning ordinance, yes. Okay, so as you sit here today, do you believe these permits are validly issued? Yes. The certificate of nonconformity validly issued? Uh, I believe so. The building permit issued? Yes. The electrical permit issued? Yes. The mechanical permit issued? Yes. And the stop work order uh, lifted? Yes. You believe that's all proper? Yes. I have no further questions. I, uh, I have one question. Um, in your answer that you believe these permits are validly issued, are, are you relying on this law department? Is that why? Yes. Okay, because we, I, in your direct, that with me, we went through the various portions of the ordinances in the city and, right. and we discussed the non-compliance of MTJ with the actual wording of the ordinances. Would you agree? Yes. Okay, nothing further. <clears throat> Well, we'll finally get to the person who wanted to get up and test, offer testimony, finally. Please. Uh, yes, the applicant's done with their testimony? Yes. Uh, we have Michael Kelly to come up and stand. Michael Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, president of MTJ Development. And do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about no. to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So I, help you, God. I do. Okay, and we do uh, have your name and address. My name, Michael P. Kelly. We have it. Thank and you. And my address is 120 Lakeview Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18505. Um, uh, a little background, just to, to be germane to the, the conversation. I'm an area developer. Primarily, our core business is the development and operation of skilled nursing, assisted living and rehabilitation centers and have done 22 of them here with today eight in Lackawanna County, four in the city. So I'm very familiar with getting through zoning, et cetera, in the city of Scranton. This business opportunity was presented to me. These were condemned properties that were, had been off the tax roll since I believe 1998 and saw this as a good opportunity um, to rehab the structures and getting back on the tax rolls and providing adequate safe housing. That's what this is all about, and that's what, I always, that's what I've done all my professional career. We went to the bank, we went to the zoning, we went through the city process, we followed the letter of the law, every step of the way what they told me to do, and I did it. I went and borrowed over $1.2 million, 
these projects are 70 percent completed to the current most stringent code um, we've downgraded the the occupancies we've increased the fire safety we've put swipe cards in we've put cameras all kinds of security to assure the safety and believe me it's very difficult for, for a developer to come to the city of Scranton and I'm going to tell you why you get so many conflicting uh, interpretations of code we could go to the fire chief and he interprets the code one way we could go to the director of licensing and permits he interprets it another way the city subcontracts out their building inspection process we go to him for interpretation completely different so it's very very um, frustrating as a developer to come to the city of Scranton we've complied with everything they've told us to do if we got these certificates of nonconformity I was assured that we're okay at that point I went out and borrowed a lot of money and I fixed these buildings up and I'm in the process of continuing to do it to have a, a couple neighbors um, who I believe just my own personal opinion are jealous now because we're fixing them up nice and we're gonna rent them probably more readily than their properties that they don't keep up and to do so now to deny us um, or, or revert the certificate of nonconformity is detrimental and financially devastating to us and we're pretty much bankrupt on the project and again I want to address the point of property taxes the property taxes over two hundred thousand dollars in arrears we paid a hundred to the county there's a hundred in escrow with PA abstract we're negotiating the final payment because we got different different numbers from Northeast collections and those taxes I assure you will be paid and that's all I have to say so any questions uh, mr. Kelly yes ma yes sir your partners in this my, have partners, they... my, my son and my son's friend yes okay have they been before the zoning board before I believe on another project they have, yes. But what does that have to do with this tonight? Well, that has to do with this tonight. It just, it just has to do with a bit of fairness. I, you know what? I love the fact that you're, you're rehabbing those. But they understand the, the big issue of parking and things like that. Um, parking is not an issue with these properties. Why not? Because we conform to all the parking requirements. You put what? We conform to the parking requirements that were in, in, in existence. We've downgraded the number of people we're taking. All we're asking to do is we took over a going concern of a property and asking to have what they had. That's all we're asking. We're not asking for any special treatment from anybody. All right. Well, how about that change when those properties got condemned? Those properties were in a, con in a, in a bankruptcy for I don't know how many years. All right. But they're also condemned for how many years? And I, I will let the illegal, or my legal team address that issue. Okay. Okay. Mr. Kelly, are you saying that those properties now have off-street parking for your uh, tenants? Specifically for each one? Yes. Um, I would defer to those guys because they're pretty much running it. But yes. I know when we went through the whole zoning thing, parking was not, we were not called on parking at all because we presented our whole plan to zoning, to, the, to licensing and permits. Because I went by there and I, I didn't see any garages or anything. I only saw, now, I don't know if there's a court behind there, <coughs> excuse me, but I didn't see any any garages or any driveways for Again, I, I, parking. Again, I'd be lying to you if I could cite everything specifically on these properties because, again, I'm more of the financial uh, Well, I backer. went to 412 yeah. specifically because that's what's on the agenda. Again, Mrs. Wardell, when somebody more astute that knows the properties better than me, you'd be better, best served a asking those questions. But I just want to address the board in one thing. Nobody did anything shady or quick here. We went right through the process. Believe me, I deal with the Department of Health and the Department of Public Welfare on a daily basis. I've built over $40, $50 million worth of construction in the city, and I follow the rules. And I think my history demonstrates that. Okay? We went. We asked, what do we need to do to get these back to where we need to be? We followed their outline to the T. And, they're not and if, if this was going to be an issue, they should have told me then and say, Mr. Kelly, don't go borrow money because this is not sure. I would not have borrowed money if I was not assured that these were All allowed. these houses, are they going to be rooming houses? They're going to be uh, a room, uh, houses for student housing. Which means a community kitchen and a community living room and then a bedroom. A community living room? There's going to be living rooms. Uh, again, I don't want to misspeak. Uh, uh, Mr. Mordell, we do have... have uh, uh, plan sketches. I'm just asking. I, individual I, floors. There's individual kitchens in each. 
Mr. Kelly does nice work. Don't misunderstand me. Excuse me? I said, you do nice work. I mean, uh, the nursing home. These, these properties are going to be beautiful. Uh, there's something, when I put my stamp on it, it's nice. And it's safe. Yes. Yes. Sure. Well, we only could talk about 412 right now. Oh, yeah, 412. That's what it says. Okay. Does anybody have any further questions of me? Not at this time. Anybody? Uh, okay. I do. Yes, sir. I, I just have one or two questions. Sure, sure go ahead. Um, you uh, have seen or are you aware of the city of Scranton's answer to the uh, petition to abandon these prop the, the proper properties, one of which you purchased, one of which was 412, with regard to the requirement of any purchaser to comply with the condemnation policy of the city of Scranton. Am I aware of it? Yeah. Yes, you? I'm aware of it. Okay. And, and sir, although you indicate that you did everything by the book, would, wouldn't that, that was not the first thing I be, you- I believe there's a, a, a legality dealing with that and how they, they, just, they address that. And well, again, I'd be remiss. I think, I think I'd let, let me- let me ask my question. Uh, let me ask my question, please. Now, the answer is the first time it was addressed was not when you bought the property and not when you started to do your financing, but it was April 29 after the zoning appeal was filed. Is that, is that accurate? I, I have no knowledge of that. Okay, thanks. Nothing further. As, right. to, as to the bankruptcy question, the Ter I have some knowledge of what happened in, with the Terranoni properties just because I dealt with the 448 Monroe property and I dealt with the, the custodian of the properties in the divorce that the Terranonis had. And procedurally what happened was Mr. Terranoni was running these, these properties. He was, he was operating them as a sole proprietorship. He was keeping the properties up. He ended up getting into a divorce proceeding with his wife and his life kind of fell apart. And he wasn't able to keep up with all the different properties. And I don't know all the specifics of Mr. Terranoni's operations with the city or with the zoning office or license and inspections or anything. But I know that, that in the divorce proceeding, Brian Kelly represented the wife and Joan Guari from Archibald represented Tony Terranoni. In the divorce proceeding, a custodian was appointed for the properties. His name was Gary Regal. He worked up at North Pocono School District as the, one of the business managers. Might have been his former job was the business manager. I don't think he's currently it. Uh, the properties were then all listed according to a court order in the divorce proceeding. They were all listed for sale as multi-unit properties. Every one of them, the ones that are on your list, the 448 Monroe Ave property, there were properties up in Dalton. There was the marital home that was up in Dalton. There were multiple properties. There had to be 15 or 20 different properties. Mr. Regal employed various realtors to market these properties and various agreements of sale were, were signed. Gary, Gary Hughes signed an agreement of sale to purchase 448 Monroe. People named Mackerel signed uh, agreements of sale for some of these Clay Avenue properties. We proceeded through the court system with the custodian and with a laundry list of creditors, the delinquent taxes for the sewer authority. Uh, there were multiple individual creditors, just people who didn't get their security deposits back, whatever. We ended up in a culmination hearing before Christmas of 2011, before Judge Harhut, on uh, a proceeding to, to, uh, to solve all the lien issues and allow for the sale of 448 Monroe. Mr. Terranoni agreed with that. He ended up signing the deed of, of conveyance along with his wife to Gary Hughes. That was done under a contempt sanction from Judge Harhut. Soon thereafter, uh, Mike Breyer represented the mackerel faction to try to get the a closing done on three of the other Clay Avenue properties. And there was another gentleman named Greg Rodenbach that was up at Capizio Realty 
and he had a similar proceeding at 210 Turnpike Road in Dalton, if, the, the, uh, if my memory serves. Uh, the court was ordering the closings on those. Taxes were going to be paid. The sewer bills were going to be paid, everything. At that point, Mr. Terranoni filed for bankruptcy. In the bankruptcy process, it is completely different than anything else that's in the civil process. The motion that Attorney uh, Ferdinand is referring to is a motion from the trustee to abandon the property. It's not the city abandoning the property. What happens in a bankruptcy is the, the custodian who was appointed by Judge Harhut now ceases to exist because now the bankruptcy court takes over and there's a stay of all collection proceedings, all management of the property, everything else. And the bankruptcy court takes over and a, a trustee is appointed to act as the manager of the properties and to see what should happen so he can marshal the assets and pay the creditors. There were probably five different mortgage foreclosure lawsuits of various sorts by various banks against all of these properties. And what the trustee realized was that the debt exceeded the value of the property. So the trustee didn't have any assets to manage, so he filed a motion to abandon the trustee's interest in the property. What that does is pave the way for the bank to then proceed with the foreclosure action and take the property. And what happened was Mr. Kelly and his group stepped into this, the shoes of the bank and they took a deed in lieu of foreclosure from Mr. Terranoni. So I don't know what the reference was to what Attorney Kelly would have filed in the bankruptcy two days later or whatever, but I think that relates to the trustee's motion the judge's order. to abandon. The judge's order, there were 14 days that were given for creditors, mm -hmm. okay? And it wasn't filed within that 14 days. Right, but I the, think the that 10th relates of October, the, the judge finalized everything. I think it relates to the trustee's order to the trustee's motion to abandon the property. That meant the trustee didn't want to manage the properties anymore, and it kind of it operates as a relief from an automatic stay. So then the the the, the banks could go forward with their collection actions. It didn't imperil. I don't believe it imperiled any of the city liens. Well, I don't know. I'd have to because go Mr. Kelly says and go over it. he paid off a hundred thousand in county taxes, and he and he's in the process of paying off another hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars in city taxes, and I, the sewer. There would be the sewer bill still would have survived. The only thing that would not have survived would have been the unsecured creditors. And there were, there were a laundry list of them as well. Members so, of the board, I, pardon me for interrupting. I, I simply asked, and this is a pleading in that very case that uh, council is describing. It's a pleading, meaning it's something prepared by and sent in by the city of Scranton notifying third parties that they must comply with the city's condemned property policy if they buy this. That's all I was trying to elicit from Mr. Kelly. And, and the, here is the pleading. It was, yes, it, I agree, it was in response to this whole process. But I asked Mr. Kelly, he was the buyer. This is the first thing the city's saying uh, before that whole transaction took place. That's, that's all I was trying to elicit. And I just wanted to make that statement to the board. All right. Now, I don't believe the bankruptcy court ruled on anything related to the condemnation. And that's when MTJ went to the city and said, what do I have to do to put these properties back onto the rolls? And we've complied with everything that the city has told us. And now we're being told to basically stop, but we're already a million dollars in. And I understand your frustration. I, I know you want to tell me you complied, OK? But no one brought any of this before the board. And, and just the way some of these things are signed, 13 people in an unspecified number of apartments. What, what is that? Well, we, we I, actually had leases. I, from you, you know what? And, and no, we, we had three people from the city sign off on that. We actually have leases from Mr. Terranoni from prior uses of these properties. Right. But again, they're condemned. Those that were condemned lost it. I'm not arguing. I don't care anything about the properties that weren't condemned. You bought 11 of them, 10 of them. I don't know. What I'm talking about are the ones that were condemned. That's what I'm talking about. This is what we're dealing with. 412 is a condemned property. And what we did, we went to the city and asked, right. what do we have to do? And we have followed what this, well, the city law department and everybody else told us to do. I, I, I think the city law department just sort of sidestepped the, the zoning board. That's what I, that's my personal feeling, okay? That's what I feel that we were just simply sidestepped on this. And right. we shouldn't have been. 
We shouldn't have been. I know. I know. And, and you know what, what are we looking for? We're looking for. You know what? Let's have the number of parking spaces we should have for these properties. All of these other people have come before us, and yeah. and you know what? Yes, they didn't have as many apartments as they liked because they had to put some parking in. I believe that parking has been discussed, and I believe no, Jonathan parking has not been discussed. This well, is not true. I, I'm dealing with a piece of paper right here that shows me there's three units. There's three units. That, okay, for three units you need one and a half. You know, you need five parking spots. Do you have five parking spots? Can I be sworn in, please? Yeah, this is, this is getting bad. I, I can, uh, Jonathan Olivetti, Attorney Jonathan Olivetti. No, I'm as a, an attorney, um, then you don't need to be sworn in. I, I'm a, a member of the company here, too, and I, I can help to clear up a lot of the procedural and back issues that the board seems to have. I probably should have came up here first because we probably could have handled a lot of this stuff at the beginning. It seems like we're going down the wrong path here. And if I can explain to you how we got to the point that we're at right now, I'd like to start from the beginning, if we may, if that's okay with the board. Okay. The, the first, and, and, and as Mr. Coach has pointed out, I've been in front of this board here before. Unsuccessfully, I may add. So I learned the hard way about the zoning requirements of the city of Scranton and what needs to be done in order to comply with them. So before purchasing these properties, I made sure to dot all my I's and cross all my T's to make sure that we didn't get jammed up again like we did on that Columbia Street property that we were in front of you guys twice on that you referenced earlier today in a different entity name, but that you referenced earlier in this meeting here right. tonight. Okay, so the first thing I would point out would be that we requested before the issuance of the building permits or the certificates of noncompliance a general inspection by the city of Scranton. There's field correction notices. I believe they should be a part of the package presented by Mr. Wallace as part of the discovery request here tonight. They're dated January 23rd of 2013, and it shows the violations that were in existence on these properties as of that date. We went into negotiations with the law department of the city. These properties had been condemned for a couple years. There had been no taxes. There had been no sore. There had been no trash paid since the 90s. We went into negotiations with them to bring them back up to code. Okay, so uh, part of the negotiations uh, uh, eventually led to whether or not we had zoning compliance because obviously we are not going to invest this much money into these buildings if we do not comply with the zoning ordinance. That led to the issuance of the certificate of nonconforming use on March 1st. It was all after the field correction notices were, after the city inspectors went out there, after negotiations to pay the back taxes took place, after inspections of the property were done and uh, the certificates were issued, there is authority in both the municipality's planning code section 613 of the municipality's planning code and section 806 B1 of the city of Scranton zoning ordinance. And I'm going to read right from it. It's in the back, so let me find it here. A property owner may request a written statement of non-conformity from the zoning officer after providing sufficient evidence as stated above. The zoning officer may, but is not required to prepare a partial list of non-conformities. Uh, to, to go above that, I'm sorry, I should have read the, proper, uh, the part above it. The party asserting the nonconformity must provide evidence that the nonconformity was lawfully created and continues to be inclined in compliance with all city regulations, etc. You guys are familiar with this part of the code. You deal with this stuff right. all the time. Okay? I believe the law was misinterpreted here earlier tonight, and I believe we had this same issue last time I was in front of the board. The passing of the six-month period after those buildings were condemned does not, it creates a rebuttable presumption that the, that the non-conforming use has been abandoned. A rebuttable presumption. A presumption that we rebutted to the city law department before we borrowed the money on these properties. We went in there with testimony from Tony Terranoni. There's been decisions, filed decisions from Judge Harhart of Lackawanna County related to these specific properties. Every inspector from, these city, from this city has been in and out of these properties for the past 20 years because of how many problems the former owner has caused in them. They were well aware that this building had been three units in the past. 
I made that very clear to the law department, and that is why the certificates of nonconformity were issued. Okay, so we went in there, we got the inspection done, we made arrangements to pay $200,000 in back taxes, get these properties back on the tax roll, and through us presenting our case to the, to the city solicitor, these were signed. Okay, so that's how the certificates of nonconforming use came about. And once you have those certificates, the building permits can be issued and there's no reason to be in front of you guys here tonight. That is why we didn't have to come in front of the zoning board in the first place. You had asked that question to Mr. Wallace earlier tonight. The answer is because there was no zoning issue because the certificates had already been issued. We shouldn't be here tonight. Those certificates of nonconformance uh, alleviate us of the requirement of getting the permission of this board to uh, get the building permit. Now, to move on, to continue, to relate to some of the, to, to the parking issue, from, that's, that's another one I heard you guys brought up here. Last time I was here, uh, well, the zoning ordinance allows for parking within, I believe it's 200 feet or 400 feet of the unit, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, 200. 200 feet. We own the building two doors up. There's about 20 parking spots behind it, 424 clay. Last time I was here, I believe Miss Newcomb, uh, uh, we, uh, had an arrangement with the local business establishment for parking last time. And you said, what happens if they sell the place? Do you remember that? Do you... So what I created here tonight to bring in anticipation of the parking being an issue is a parking easement agreement. May, may, I, I, may I just raise something, members of the board? I, I yeah, if, if I may, uh, because it, it goes to his testimony. Uh, and that is this. I, I believe the applicant tonight, the appellant, is here on the procedural issue of should these permits have issued uh, without coming to the board. This I call substantive hard zoning we're, that we're getting into now that I don't think we're prepared to discuss because we're coming here saying this matter, should, the permits shouldn't have been issued without coming here. And then it would be up to the, the applicant, to the landowner, to come to the board. In, and they could come in a variety of ways. So I, what I'm saying is I'm prepared and came to you to discuss the procedural issue. I feel unprepared to discuss the hard, I don't know if they're going to talk variance, parking, non-conforming, you know, non-conformity. Uh, I just don't know how far we're going to go. Well, I think I addressed the procedural issue by saying we did not need to be here in the first place because we had certificates of nonconforming use signed before we applied for the building permit. That is the procedural issue. I also have a, a, an issue relating to the applicant's standing. Uh, I, I, as a matter of fact, let, 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 as a, I, I believe as to the permits, we're talking, if we comply with every zoning permit question, we don't need a special use a special exception of variance anything we don't have to come before the board as long as we comply and I believe the board had questions on the zoning and whether we complied with the zoning and now Jonathan was going to get into the parking easement and and are we in compliance uh, there is a mechanism in the zoning ordinance for use of, of a certificate the, the mechanism board. is they feel you did not do the right thing yeah. that the permits should not have been issued they were issued he is appealing the issue of, of those permits. What we're going to decide is whether Mr. Wallace was right or wrong in issuing that. That's what this is just down to. That's we right. don't need to worry about parking or anything else. But that, that's where we're... This is not this, a this is an appeal. This is an appeal of the permits. This is not... I, I, respectfully, I do not agree that is, it is the board's decision tonight to appeal whether or not those certificates of nonconformity were issued properly. It is whether the building permits were issued properly. And the building permits were issued properly, in my opinion, if the certificate of nonconformity yes. had already been signed yes. and issued. And, and that is your opinion. And as we all know, where that can be solved, you have the right to appeal our decision. Okay? We, we all have a, a method of solving the problem. So... That's where it will end up, I'm sure. Uh, I'm going to bring I, up one more issue. I have. Uh, d you had a question about the parking. Do you want? Do you want me to address it? There's no need to address that. Yeah. Excuse me. There's no need to address that. We're just going to stick with the issue of the of uh, 412 and 
the issuance of the uh, work permits. Okay, well then uh, one more thing while I'm up here is um, I'm having a hard time understanding how the applicant was harmed. And, and it just so happened that I ran into the principal of 1021 Mulberry uh, just yesterday and asked him what the reason for this appeal was. And I was told that their buildings aren't full, that they're, that they're not occupied. Is he here to offer this testimony? Uh, he is here tonight. Is he offering that testimony? I'll, I'll call him as a witness. Uh, I, I believe it's Don Monono. It was, it was Monday. I apologize. It was Monday. But we did have the conversation, and it's relevant to our proceedings Dan, here tonight. Your opinion? Uh, Mr. Olivetti, is evidence of proof of harm a key factor in making this decision? I, I mean, I, I prefer to have the testimony. I, I, don't, I don't have a, a, any part of the law that says that. Yeah, no, I, but, I do, as a matter okay, of fact. Okay, that, that's um, what I'm asking. Yes, I do. And can I compel this gentleman to come up and testify? He's the, if he is a principal of the appellant, you can. Or my only objection is, is that I, I know the rules of evidence are relaxed, but, but I don't think evidence of harm is any issue in this, in this case. It's, it's only the well, procedural issuance of the permit. Well, I, I think it goes to the standing of the, the applicant. Just because you have a property that's across the street doesn't mean that you can just come in and invalidate every permit oh, and that, have no harm. If I may, please, if I may, if I can have you guys look at section 111E9B, which says that the board shall determine that a person or business does not have standing if the board determines that such person or business is apparently motivated primarily by an attempt to inhi inhibit reasonable competition. I don't think they should even have standing to even be here tonight. The only reason they're here is because our buildings are rented and theirs aren't. You should dismiss this case based on that. It's right in the, it's right in the ordinance. The board shall. The board shall determine. You, you came before us for Columbia Street, right? I did. That was a condemned property. It was. So you needed to be here because you wanted to. Which is exactly why I did what I did this time around. But which is exactly why, which is why you should be here now, but not for an appeal. You should be here in front of us trying to get a, a condemned property back on the tax rolls. That's why you should be here. That's why. Well, we did. We complied with the condemned property policy. You, I mean, you can, you're complying with this, this with, with nonconformity sheet, which is why you didn't have to come before us, because that was signed, in my opinion, well, inappropriately. I don't know how anybody Jeff, can make the... Let me respond, okay? Uh, Mr. Newcomb, I believe uh, a person makes an application to the building permit officer, and then the permit officer makes a decision on whether a permit should be issued or not issued. And if they deny it, then we come to the board and we, we make an application no, for a variance okay. or, or whatever relief would be required. But once the That's not necessarily true. The municipality's planning code and the zoning ordinance give the zoning officer deference to issue a certificate of nonconforming use if it is proven to him sufficiently that the use he, had not been abandoned. He also not, said also that he also said that if he was not compelled to sign this form, then he probably would have told them they need to come before us. He also said he went to the legal department and they, that's who we dealt with to prove this, that they are the ones that found, uh, and I, I have letters in here that we wrote well, to the legal department. That's uh, what I was asking about, about, about the, uh, the um, I, I don't even know. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of confusion of the mind. issues here, and, and, and that's, you know, we're bringing up different properties, we're bringing up uh, different companies' names, we're bringing up uh, different, different homes that oh, well. are being appealed here tonight. Because we're, just, we're just going to go on one property, that's all we're going to deal with at this point in time. Is there any other testimony? I mean, the testimony is simply, I, I, didn't, I didn't get to cross-examine the witness as, as to his, his motivation. And I, and I just the, I had to... Uh, I, it's, he said it to me the other day that the reason they're here is that they are not full. But again, that's hearsay. You're telling me what somebody said. Uh, okay, can, can, that's, 
Can, can yeah. we, we it's, call? It's not here, so if, he, if they can produce him. He's here. He's here. Can we call him as a witness? He's the appellant. Do I have a subpoena power to bring that guy up here? He, you don't need a subpoena power. He's a party. All right. He, he is the party. I was, just forced to, uh, I was just forced to tell him what I was uh, going to question him about. Yes, I do. There's only one appellant. Let's, let's let that be clear. One person filed the appeal. One person wrote the check. There's one person here. Raise your right hand, please. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. I do. To please state your name and address and spell your last name. Donald Mamano, M-A-M-M-A-N-O, 56 Ledge Drive, Lakeville, PA. Where's your address? Lakeville. Where's Lakeville? Lakeville is Lakeville by Lake Wall and Paul Pack. Okay. Uh, so you're not a Scranton resident? I am not a Scranton resident. Okay. What properties does 1021 Mulberry LLC I thought you had a question for me. It's my attorney. What property? Okay. What properties does 1021 Mulberry LLC? Can we look at the map for you? Absolutely. Do you recognize the map? We recognize the map. Well, there's Mul my street. Mulberry Street. Mulberry, so okay. Mulberry and Clay would be right here. So this is my property, 1021 Mulberry. Okay. So, and you're pointing to, is it one property or two? This or the, is the property that's 1021 Mulberry. Okay. So that would be the middle property identified. I this property as well, if that has any relevance to your question. Okay. Under what name? 405 Clay Avenue. Okay. So you own maps. 38, 37, and 36 in on Mulberry Street. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, okay, and are these all multi-unit dwellings? Yes, they are. And are they all occupied? Yes, they are. They're completely occupied? Yes, they are. Okay, do you recall? I mean, they're not, no, they're not occupied today because my tenants are college students, so they go home for the summer. Do you have valid leases for next year with those t same I do. tenants? What he's getting at is those properties are not affected by this appeal financially by any means. I have them rented out for two years. I have leases to prove it. So my financial hardship, that is not a problem. Did you, do you recall having a conversation with Jonathan Olivetti a few days ago? I do ago? recall having a conversation with Jonathan Olivetti. Okay, what was that conversation? Do I remember word by word? I was running late to an appointment. I had my uncle in the car I had to take to the airport. I was running out the door. He approached me. He did mention that uh, if there was an appeal filed, he'd be obligated to file a lawsuit against me. Did you not say that? Uh, what was the substance of your conversation related to your He was standing? asking about the appeal. Okay. What's the motive behind it? What, what's going on with the appeal? What, what will it take for us to drop the appeal? He said, how much, what do you want? He said, what do you want to drop the appeal? I said, nothing. I want you to go before the zoning board. Did I not say this? Oh. You brought me up here for questioning. I'm here to talk to you about it. You want to talk about the conversation? I actually have a witness that was there for the conversation if you want me to bring him in. The question, I thought I was doing the question here, but the question is simply, is simply, did you or did you not say to me the other day that the reason for the appeal is because people are mad that their buildings are not full because we are providing housing in the neighborhood? Did you or did you not say that? I did say that a lot of the affected property owners are upset about the appeal, why they filed the appeal was because there wasn't a level playing field and they were doing things to houses that not any other landlord could do. Oh, meaning right. buy a condemned property, not come before the board, and do whatever you want to do before it. That's why the other affected property owners that have been in business 10 to 30 years were offended by it, and that's why we thought they should be before the zoning board. That's all. No further questions. Are you I will again relate back to section 111E9. B and say that the board shall determine that the appellant does not have standing if they are financially motivated to be here tonight. And I think, I think the answer was just a resounding yes. He just admitted that the reason he is here tonight is because the other property owners are not full. And this board has to dismiss if they find that that is the reason that we're here tonight. Do you have anything else to offer? Do you have any questions for me? I'm Anybody have any questions? Nope. I would ask that our exhibits be admitted into the record. I believe there's four of them. There's an assessment map. There's a certificate of nonconformity dated. Um, I can't hear a word you're saying, to be honest uh, with you. Okay, I'm sorry. I just ask that our, our uh, exhibits that I believe I've circulated among everyone, the assessment map, the certificate mm -hmm. of nonconformity dated March 1st, 2013, 
Uh, there's three permits. There's a building permit. There's an electrical permit and a mechanical permit that were included in Attorney Ferdinand's uh, packet. And then the affidavit regarding the condemnation. I just ask that they be included in the record of this proceeding. All right. Any objection? No objection. So admitted. Is there anybody else here to offer testimony? Is there anybody else on the board? Entertain a motion. I'll make the motion. I'll, I'll second it, but I'm unclear of the motion we're making. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm, I'm so confused at this point, what we're supposed to be doing. Dan, could you just review it for me, please? <laughs> it's an appeal from the issuance of the building oh, yeah, permits. That, that part I know, but like, okay. what are we supposed to be voting on? Like, uh, Are we going to uphold the appeal, meaning that the Okay. Building permits were incorrectly issued. Okay. Got so it. you're upholding the appeal in that case. Okay. Or denying the appeal, which means that you feel that the permits were correctly issued. Okay. So it's uphold the appeal or deny the appeal. Did the board understand? I'm good. Yes. Everybody okay? Uh -huh. Yep. Mr. Wallace, motion made and seconded. Could you please take a vote? Mrs. Newcomb. I vote to uphold the appeal. Mrs. Wardell. Uphold. Mrs. Mr. Bartnicki. Yes. Mr. Stangy. Uphold. Mr. Coaches. Uphold. By a vote of five to zero, your petition is granted. Thank you. Mr. Wallace. Thanks so much. Mark, please call the last case. Mark Lucci, 1741 Thank Perry you. Avenue. Applicants Thank seek you. use and parking variances to operate a retail winery at 1741 Perry Avenue, R1A zone. We're going to take a, Mr. Lutz, we're going to take a break for a minute. Did they bring the plans? Say what we're going to do. Lay out of the business and parking layout.
dark the wish is. which hopefully we, we will be a welcome change from the last three. Uh, my name is James Mang and I represent Mark Lucci, who is the applicant here. And he is seeking a, a use variance to operate a retail winery out of his father's home. It's, it's, the business will be run by him and his father. Uh, the summary of the argument it really is the Lucci's have f for several years made homemade wine under the LCB uh, limits and they now want to be able to sell the wine to the public. To that end, of course, they need to get a limited uh, winery license from the LCB. Step number one in that process is to get a, a, a permit to operate in the house, which brings us here tonight. We're seeking a use variance only to allow uh, this, uh, this general home occupation. The problem is the winery doesn't really fit into any of the general uh, home occupations. Uh, the hardship is that without the zoning permit, they can't sell wine and can't get their LCB license. The uniqueness is, I think, that the zoning ordinance never envisioned a winery as a home use. It was written a long time ago. We all know lots of old Italian families that made wine in the cellar, but no one really thought about it being a business because you couldn't get a license to do that in Pennsylvania until very recently. And with that background, I'd like to uh, ask Mr. Lucci some questions. To raise your right hand. Solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Please state your name and address. Mark Lucci, uh, 1747 Beaumont Avenue, B-E-A-U-M-O-N-T, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18508. Mr. Lucci, uh, who owns the property at 1741 Perry? My father, Bob, and my mom, Mary. And how long have you and your father been uh, making wine? Um, my dad's been doing it his whole life. I got involved probably about the last 15 years. In this, at, always at this location? Correct. Uh, have you ever had any complaints or citations from the city? No. Uh, uh, neighbors' complaints? No. Okay. And where do you make the wine at 1741 Perry? Uh, in my dad's basement. Okay. Now, how many people work there? Just me and my dad. Okay. So you don't have you you don't pay any outside employees? Zero employees. Okay. Do you have off-street parking? Yes, we do. And what does that consist of? Uh, we have a two-car garage in the backyard that we designate for uh, off-street parking that we plan on putting a uh, sign on. Okay. <clears throat> Strictly for wine business, yes. Is that the picture? The that's, area? that's correct. Uh, now, that, this is a two-spot uh, parking, but it's in front of a garage. That's correct. Wouldn't that interfere with your use of the garage? No. What, what do you use the garage for? Right now my mom uses it, but we're going to be using it for storage. Okay. So there Probably would be actually make wine in there and sell them out of the basement. Okay. So there would be no cars going into that garage. Right. Okay. And how about uh, the, the neighborhood off-street park or on-street parking? I provided uh, just one day in the rain. I went around. Took, uh, there's plenty of parking you could see in all the neighbors. Uh, we have plenty of parking in front of the house, back of the house, all of our neighbors. Most of them have driveways. Uh, just to show that there's not going to be any problems as far as parking. First of all, I, I, I want to reiterate, like, this isn't going to be a retail operation or anything. It's a seasonal operation. And uh, sales will be conducted by uh, phone orders, friends, family. You know, we get a lot of uh, requests for our wine. And it costs too much money to just make and give it away. So we want to sell it and get our money and everything. So that's where we're at right now. Okay. <clears throat> I, mean, I just don't want the board to think that the store hours in a residential uh, neighborhood or anything. Uh, 5 p.m. The ones in the yellow were 5 p.m. Monday in the rain. Uh, the ones in the pink might have been about 1 in the afternoon. Um, and that was probably back in the end of April. So it's indicative of what the streets look like that's, during, oh, during the middle of the day. That's correct. Yep. Okay. Uh, so why are we? Why are you applying for the for the zoning variance now? Because I want to apply for a limited winery license. Okay. That's all I got. 
Well, this is real simple then. Yeah. You will not have any hours of operation? Negative, sir. Strictly by appointment? Strictly by phone, order, Ferenc family, correct. You have no employees other than just, yourself? Just, just me and my dad. And your dad? Dan. Yes. What are we looking for in this one? What do we need? I, I guess what do we need in parking? What do we need in the? I'm, I'm looking at M Mr. Lucci. I guess we need a little bit more as to how much you're going to sell to the public. Like what? How many customers a week? What? What do you? What? What are you looking well, at? Well, what we're, as far as customers, at any given time, there might be four or five people come into the house, and like I said, I want to let the board know that. This is a seasonal thing. September, we start making the wine. Christmas, 90% of our sales would be for the holiday. Other than that, it's just people calling, whatever they want to come over, and, and you know, some of the neighbors they call different hours, whatever. Can we meet you at the house and get some wine or something like that? But we're not. I, I mean, as far as parking, it's really not going to be an issue. How many gallons are you talking about? They're going to make. Well, right now we're doing about 200, but we want to bump it. You know. <coughs> Upon getting that license, you know, because of demand. <clears throat> what are you looking at making? Probably about start out six hundred. This is small time operation. Yeah. Are you going to make it in the garage? Is that what you said, or in the, in the basement? Well, or right, we'll be doing it in the basement for now. Mm -hmm. No, and then, like I said, if we expand, we'll probably expand into the garage a little bit. Why don't you explain how you how you make it the, the juices? Well, I, I, we order the juice every year from Malakari Produce in uh, Plains. Comes up in a Penske truck, drops the barrels, wheels them into our basement. We have our barrels down there. We sanitize everything. We pump it from the top of our steps into our basement, and we ferment it. But we were a limited room. I have pictures of our basement there. So as naturally we expand, we'll probably put stuff in the garage. We'll start fermenting in our garage and sell out of the basement. <clears throat> so there's no it's waste. Really it's really a small operation. We just want to legalize it. We don't want to get in any trouble. We're not pressing grapes. We're not worried about any of that. No. No. I mean, it, it, you asked me about parking. It's a difficult thing to, to see. Under our regulations, there is a provision for seasonal sales of agricultural products. Is that what this is? I'm not so sure. Yeah. And it talks about one space, one off space off-street parking space per employee, which there are none, and I mean, one, one 600 every gallons is only 600 people that'll buy a gallon each. I mean, spread out over the course of a year, it's not, it's not that much. It's not a lot of bodies. It's not a lot of bodies, and they do have two, two off-street parking spots. But there, uh, by the way, there are pictures of the basement in that pile. I, I saw them already. Okay. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? And there's there's no retail space for this. I mean, there's no 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 store display front, no. area or anything. I mean, no, nope, nope. Okay. <clears throat> no other questions. Anybody here in the audience to offer any testimony, or do you all want to go home? We, we all have a very uh, friendly audience here. <laughs> I, I suggested to them they may not want to get up. <laughs> all right. I'll entertain a motion. Well, eventually, probably. Yeah, the house in the garage. Yeah. The house in the garage. Probably, yeah, for the house in the garage, yeah. I'll make a motion. Second. A motion made and seconded. Mr. Wallace, could you please take a vote? Yes. 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 Yes, by a vote of five to zero, your application's approved. Good luck. Thank you, guys. Thank Good you. Luck. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Mr. Wallace, just to put it on the record, I certainly would like to apologize to you for having to testify this evening. Uh, I know it had to be very difficult, and uh, I do thank you for your testimony. And I, I, I'm sorry, Mike, but all right. We are adjourned.